which will be presented by Dr. Milinda Patiraja from the Faculty of Architecture. Thirdly, we have a session on digital economy, which will be moderated by Dr. Subha Fernando from the uh, Faculty of Information Technology. Finally, to conclude our sessions, we will have a session on research and policy making, which will be uh, moderated by senior professor Malik Ranasinghe uh, from the Faculty of Engineering. As I mentioned earlier, we have invited an eminent set of panel members. And therefore, I believe you will have a very enjoyable and engaging set of discussions today. And you will take away something from today's discussions to apply for your own work. Therefore, without further ado, let's move on to the first session for the day, which is um, on agriculture, food processing, and manufacturing. The theme of this discussion is fostering effective flow of academic knowledge and research results into the industry and society in facing global challenges. This will be moderated by Dr. Tusita Sugadapala, who is a senior lecturer from the Faculty of Engineering. Now I hand over to Dr. Tusita Sugadapala to commence the session and also introduce. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is, as you said, is the first session uh, uh, on the uh, this forum. Uh, so we have uh, three uh, eminent personals uh, representing the our own university, the industry, and also uh, international expert. Uh, let me first introduce them and then uh, brief you uh, the. Uh, work plan or the agenda for this 45 minutes uh, in a discussion. Now we have uh, uh, with us today, Professor Noguchi uh, Yoso uh, uh, from Faculty of Life and Environmental Science, the University of uh, Tsukuba uh, from, uh, from Japan. Uh, uh, so he uh, basically uh, work in the uh, area of uh, agriculture engineering, then uh, went into later on food processing, uh, which is also a topic uh, today, and also uh, on biomass energy, uh, which is also very important for, for the local context. So welcome, Professor uh, uh, Naguchi, uh, for this uh, session. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, uh, from the industry, representing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the local industry, Mr. Devakant Virusuriya uh, is a director of engineering. Uh, manufacturing uh, in Cargill Ceylon Food Manufacturing Group, one of the leading, uh, you know, manuf uh, the food, uh, uh, you know, industry, uh, the, the business in Sri Lanka. So uh, again, uh, now his basically background start from this uh, as a, you know, marine engineer, and then uh, went into this food industry, uh, uh, joined with the Unilever uh, Ceylon in 1995, uh, then as uh, in a chief engineer, uh, especially Walls Ice Cream, uh, all of us like that brand. Uh, and then uh, moving into uh, uh, Cargill Ceylon PLC with the sales of the Walls factory from Unilever, uh, Unilever, uh, Unilever to them. And presently, I work as a director of engineering and, and has a lot of experience in this uh, area. So, so we are expecting to hear from uh, him basically on uh, uh, food uh, in a processing as well as a manufacturing uh, both together. Finally, uh, the third panelist uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Himan uh, Punchieva, he's the head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, the Faculty of Engineering from Morotu. Basically, he's uh, a kind of an expert in all these areas, working in the manufacturing, and also uh, has an interest in agriculture. You, you have been uh, looking at developing a, a course, uh, undergraduate degree program or postgraduate in agriculture engineering. That might come in the future. Uh, he has a background, basically, he's an engineer, uh, passed out from Motor University, uh, uh, the, our own department, mechanical engineering in 2001. They did an MSc in industrial engineering and engineering management from Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. 
and PhD uh, from Lahpara University, that's in 2007. So he has been working as a senior lecturer uh, and now the head of the department. So that's basically our panel. Uh, I will brief you the, uh, you know, the working agenda for this session. Uh, I will first uh, raise a few questions uh, or direct some questions to each of these panelists uh, to first introduce their work as well as giving some, uh, you know, uh, thoughts on the topic we discuss here, especially looking at the agriculture, then uh, uh, food processing and manufacturing, uh, and, and, and particularly emphasis on this, uh, you know, importance, you know, of these research results, which are generated in, this, uh, in the university, how it uh, can contribute to the uh, national economy through uh, transforming these results uh, into the industry, to the society at large. So what we had to do, you know, that aspect will be discussed. Uh, so that, uh, so that's the first round of questions uh, from each. Uh, so they might also present their, uh, you know, the ideas with a, a PowerPoint presentation, or it can be a speech. Then uh, I will have another round of uh, question, a secondary follow-up question from these three, uh, to you know understand more on this area, especially highlighting the the topic, you know, the theme today. Uh, then uh, we'll start, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, we allow the uh, audience also to uh, uh, raise questions. If you have time, you can take these uh, few questions. Uh, if you have any questions, I think you can use the chat uh, uh, chat uh, to, uh, you know, post. I will then uh, look at those and select some questions. And then finally, we'll have a kind of a final uh, round of conclusive uh, remarks from the three panelists. And also I will summarize uh, the whole session. So that's the work plan. Uh, let me uh, first give a kind of a background on this uh, particular uh, topic, why we have this topic and what is important. Uh, now we look at this agriculture, food processing and manufacturing. These are nationally important, especially for economic development and social development. And uh, also these are interconnected and, 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 and uh, have uh, kind of a common goals towards sustainable development. That's also a kind of a theme uh, in this uh, whole forum. Uh, so that's one thing. Like uh, these are uh, directly linked to the uh, this uh, you know sustainable development and and also social economy development in the country. Then uh, also when you look at uh, the progression, how far we have uh, moved uh, you know forward in this line, especially in the country of sustainable development, uh, we have what you call the sustainable goals and and uh, 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 this uh, uh, the, the uh, UN sustainable development report 2021. Uh, shows uh, all the countries, the partner countries or member countries, what their uh, stages of development because uh, uh, SDGs came into 20, uh, sorry, uh, 2015 and now we are almost uh, uh, six, seven years you know, into the, uh, you know, the uh, period and it's, it's, uh, finally we want to achieve this one in 2030. Now we look at this, uh, you know, the present progress uh, in Sri Lanka, we have what you call SDG dashboard uh, country page. Uh, you can uh, refer that even the the uh, UN Sustainable Development Report launched uh, in 2021 highlight that uh, some of these in, uh, SDGs linked to these three sectors. One is SDG two, the zero hunger. Uh, when you look at uh, then we have SDG nine, the industry innovation and infrastructure aspect. That's uh, partially is linked here. Uh, both cases we are ranked uh, as uh, having major challenges. Uh, to uh, you know, reach the sustainable development goals, uh, and also uh, when you look at the score, uh, when you look at the progress, uh, the 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 rate of progress also says moderate, uh, but uh, not uh, sufficient to attain the goal. So we are lagging behind, and this of course affected by uh, COVID nineteen, you know, this pandemic, and you know, it started as a you know the health crisis, but now it has gone to social and economic crisis. So therefore. Now we are really facing challenges of achieving this goal and 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 uh, this goal. So therefore, that's one area. And also recently, uh, we know this uh, with the this COP the conference of parties, uh, the twenty six COP twenty six, uh, the uh, which was held in Glasgow. Uh, we have committed uh, certain you know the 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 targets in terms of carbon emission, uh, particularly reaching uh, you know the carbon neutrality by twenty fifty. Uh, and also sectoral, there are targets. So, so, so when you look at these SDGs and indices, nothing this in mind contribution, uh, we see there are a lot of targets where we have to implement during this period, like 20, uh, till 2030, both SDGs and indices. Uh, so in that extent, in fact, government has taken some, you know, 
uh, important decision or, or you know actions intervention especially looking at this uh, what you call this 3r the response recovery and redesign approach in uh, covid-19 pandemic circumstances uh, by you know revising some of the policies like agricultural policy being updated now and does the policy being updated final stage so, so the policy developments are happening, and 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 some of uh, our own colleagues here uh, contribute in that one. But we need more, uh, you know, input from uh, our side uh, to this policy making. And also, uh, we have the the the, the government, especially president, has appointed some task team or task forces, uh, especially in green economy, agriculture, where all these uh, areas we highlight: agriculture, food processing, and manufacturing become rather highlighted as some of the uh, you know national uh, you know important you know, the the, uh, the prior, uh, priorities. But the issue there is basically what's our role as a university, as academics, uh, as researchers, uh, what's our role uh, for contribution of this, you know, uh, as a technological university, you know, uh, how we can, uh, you know, uh, contribute to this one by fostering effective flow of academic and knowledge uh, research research into the industry and the society uh, in facing these uh, local and global challenges. So that's the uh, kind of a you know background I'm just highlighting. Uh, so with that background, I will first ask or rather uh, you know raise uh, the direct the question to Dr. Himan. Uh, particularly, uh, he has been uh, I think you have been uh, 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 have a, a broader experience in these three sectors: agriculture, food processing, and manufacturing. Uh, not only research, but also uh, development policies. Uh, I know you have been in only the industrial policy development. And, uh, and 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 also curriculum development and so on. I would like to know uh, your perception on this uh, present status, uh, if you uh, on effective translation of uh, research results, uh, the results of research what you do uh, for evidence based uh, decision making, or also uh, flow into uh, uh, those results into the industry and society to impact on socioeconomic development. Where are we? Like uh, whether uh, we are uh, our contribution is you know satisfactory or we have some gaps. What are the challenges? I thought you can also bring uh, you know some of your own experience. So it's over to you, uh, Dr. Himan. If you have presentation, I think you can share the screen and do that. Thank you. Over to you, uh, uh, Himan. I will uh, give yeah. you around three to uh, four to five minutes for this. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zabala, for. Uh, Introducing me, can can I have the privilege to share the screen? Um, let me. I think I can't give like uh, the organizers can give that. You know, uh, uh, anyone? Can you connect now? No, not yet. Um, can anyone Kalindu, from the organizing team? Can yeah, somebody. Answer? Kalindu, can you make me a co-host? We need that for other panelists also. I think that should be yeah. uh, even at the beginning. Can one? Uh, some, some, uh, some, some, not yet. Uh, Kalindu or President Deangani, you should be able to give. Not yet. Uh, let me contact. Ah, yes, now it's possible. Yeah, sorry for delay. Right. Yeah, uh, now it's done. Right, I'll, I'll start the discussion by giving a brief on the status of the agriculture sector in Sri Lanka, and then we'll just talk about the challenges we have. That's where we can uh, discuss about the interventions that we can make in the uh, make to develop this sector in Sri Lanka. 
where we can where how we can work together the industry foreign part, uh, partners and us working together in order to develop this industry so uh, let me give the give a brief uh, description of the status now uh, the the contribution to the gdp in terms of agriculture is hovering around 7 7.4 uh, in that region uh, with time the contribution of uh, the agriculture sector to the gdp has reduced over the over the years if you look at this you can you'll be able to clearly see how the contribution of gdp from the agriculture sector reducing so from the 1960s it has been around 30 30% now it's down to 7% as i told you earlier so it has been gradually coming down and at the same time if you look at the employment in agriculture the percentage employment has drastically reduced especially during the past 10 years it has reduced to 24% of the population uh, from around one third of the population. So that's a quite an alarming decrease. And at the same time, if you look at the, uh, the uh, contribution of GDP from crops and animal husbandry, animal husbandry, uh, fishing and animal husbandry, it's like 21 fourth one fourth of the entire contribution to the GDP from the agriculture sector. So we have a good uh, contribution from the crop sector, uh, not the animal husbandry. And talking about, uh, as Dr. Suthapala mentioned, uh, the contribution uh, to uh, the GHG emissions by different crops, different uh, agricultural uh, products. If you look at this, this is an interesting kind of graph where we see that when you go for uh, animal-based or animal-based products, uh, agricultural products, the contribution to the GHG emissions become huge. If you take uh, groundnuts, uh, citrus, apples, they have very low contribution to GHG emissions. But uh, when the amount of effort towards getting the crops, uh, the produce, depending on the amount that, the amount of effort that you put in, the GHG emissions increase. So it's kind of an alarming situation and it gives us some impetus on what kind of action that we need to take. What are the things that we need to concentrate on? What are the, like, a, it's like a cost and benefit analysis where we, if you spend a lot of money, if you uh, uh, put a lot of effort into production of food, then sometimes uh, we end up producing or causing harm to the environment. And if you look at the, on the other side, now here, if you take beef, it has the highest contribution of GHG emissions per kilogram of food produced. Uh, and if you take uh, the vegetables and stuff, they have a very low contribution of GHG emissions in terms of GHG emissions. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the usable protein from a pound, uh, pounds per acre, again, if you take uh, the vegetable-based or the plant-based products, it, they have a higher contribution, higher content of protein per acre. If you take beef, it doesn't perform well. Um, milk, uh, eggs, meat, all these things perform, don't perform well in terms of pounds per acre or kilograms per acre in terms of the protein that we need. If you look at the challenges, I got this from the FAO. They have done a specific study on the Sri Lankan agricultural sector. The issues that we have, the challenges that we have are like subsistence farming and doing part-time farming. They are not mechanized. They are, they, we don't put much emphasis on uh, organized farming, poor soil fertility, high cost of production as a result of all this. Then post-harvest losses, 
low level of mechanization where the universities, uh, the research institutes can directly get involved in. Uh, and low levels of R&D in general, uh, there's not, not much emphasis on R&D in this sector. That's uh, something which is alarming in the Sri Lankan context. And low adoption of ICT, whereas in developed countries, they use a lot of IT to process information, collect data, process information, process data and uh, use information to uh, improve efficiency of, the, uh, of these agricultural products. Uh, like that, there are many, many challenges that we have. So in order to, uh, if I uh, quote some examples, uh, some time back, we, we, we've been working on developing a selective tea plucker for the Sri Lankan industry because we do selective tea plucking. We, uh, we pluck only two buds and a leaf. We've been developing this for several years, but, and there was an industry industry party that was interested in developing this, but the partnership didn't go the full distance. We ended up developing a partial product and it didn't go. Then uh, we developed for post, uh, say, food processing industry, we developed a layout for uh, uh, milk products. Uh, so we developed a factory layout, a special layout for uh, factories that, that can be employed anywhere. Then uh, if we take uh, packaging, for packaging, there had been a lot of research uh, that was done, but the problem is they don't reach the intended parties. So that is some issue, some uh, challenge that we have. So as a, as a uh, uh, solution, what I proposed in the, uh, to the university was to develop a research institute or maybe R&D institute, which also focuses on the manufacturing aspect. Now, if product development stays at the development stage and they don't go for production, then that, that won't do. So it has to go to the manufacturing level. So I proposed an entity called uh, farm facilitation center for agriculture, infrastructure, machinery, and equipment research. It's a university. I propose it as a university-based uh, entity where we carry out an undergraduate and postgraduate and uh, say research, and then we AI from the same entity uh, where we can do uh, community extension uh, programs where we educate the relevant parties, relevant stakeholders in various aspects. And in order to bring in new projects to work on different de uh, product development and so on, to have a liaison with, where they directly work with industry partners and the foreign, foreign partners, possible foreign partners, funding agencies and so on, to develop uh, these areas, develop the agricultural sector in order to alleviate the, uh, the challenges that I mentioned earlier. So this kind of approach, I think, would be beneficial for Sri Lanka. And that, that's how we need to go towards uh, the development of the sector. The special emphasis that I need, uh, I, I put is the manufacturing aspect. We normally do research and we develop and the whatever that we develop end up in the, in the research center without going for production and manufacturing for, to provide large benefits for, to the community. That's the, uh, that's the area that we need to focus on as an uh, institute. Thank you, Dr. Himan. Uh, in fact, uh, you have answered also my follow-up question. Uh, uh, I expected you to present the challenges, but of course now uh, it's, I think, better now. So we are looking at also the solution so we can also get the feedback from other, you know, the panelists also in that line, because we have both from the industry and also from the international experts so that we can see how uh, they could, uh, you know, see this one, how they see and how they could contribute. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ima. Uh, next, uh, I would like to open this uh, discussion to uh, Mr. Devakant uh, from the industry. Now already now, Mr. Devakant has uh, you have vast experience in food processing and 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 also manufacturing. So I think it's ideal uh, fit in here. 
so uh, so in that context, uh, as also the, the, uh, Dr. Himan Hail at the challenges as well as the type of model he presented, which has industry as one of the core, you know, the, the key uh, stakeholder. So, uh, so in that context, uh, uh, can you first share with your experience on this food processing sector, uh, especially it's linked to, uh, you know, agriculture and uh, Dr. Himan indicated that there's a, you know, the downward trend in the sectors in agriculture that will maybe has also reflected in food processing. So what's your experience, you know, what's happening now, what's the future direction? And that's something I would be, uh, you know, get from your uh, thing, and also, uh, you know, indicating what's the role of local solution, local development, local research, you know, industry, whether there's a room for that, and and also looking at this person uh, COVID crisis, how we are going to face those. So those are some of the areas you can highlight. But then, of course, uh, you can present uh, your, uh, you know, the ideas on that. Uh, thank you. Over to uh, Mr. Devakar. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, the University of Maratua for inviting me, uh, representing the, 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 the food industry uh, for this forum. Um, uh, to your, your, your questions, uh, Dr. Sugutapala, now, uh, what I can say is from early 90s, the, the, the food industry, uh, food processing industry in Sri Lanka has uh, developed a, a, a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, in uh, in technical technological advances and uh, uh, and uh, uh, to uh, to increase the, the product quality and hygienic standards, you know, and uh, more and more the the, the supplier the, the the manufacturers are aware of the the, the quality improvements, you know, uh, and the importance of quality improvements, you know, and they they go for these ISO certification and new regulations comes on uh, food safety and uh, food quality. And uh, so this is a huge uh, improvement uh, in the food industry as far as I can see. Uh, and uh, the, the, the basic areas, you know, that uh, develop uh, pass over the years is, uh, is the, the packaging types, you know. Uh, uh, you have various new packaging types, you know, and uh, many processing equipment came into uh, to, uh, to, to the business. And uh, especially the hygienic practices, you know, we uh, we developed, you know, you know, and uh, practice you know, in the food industry, uh, which has improved the product quality uh, and the final product quality to the consum uh, consumers. And uh, uh, for example, you know, I can say, you know, as for my previous uh, company, uh, Unilever, they 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 started the Walls ice cream factory, and uh, at that time, the ice cream making, you know, in Sri Lanka is uh, is not very organized. Uh, uh, industry, you know, and then uh, when they came, uh, they they wanted to to uh, to uh, introduce these walls uh, branded ice cream, you know, in, in worldwide uh, is, is a walls brand is, is available, you know, in Unilever. So uh, they brought all the, the the processing technologies, you know, such as you know high pressure homogenizing and blast freezing to preserve the the product quality. And uh, and then uh, they bought the hygienic practices, you know, where we the, the people are highly trained, you know, to to preserve the, the hygienic uh, uh, integrity of the of the product. And then uh, the training and uh, and especially distribution of cold chain, you know, with eutectic systems, you know, to preserve the temperature until the consumer have the product. So that way, the the industry, uh, the, the the product as as the ice cream actually as a product, you know, as as uh, has developed, you know, and the people uh, uh, came to know the right quality ice cream, you know, it's, it's the texture. Earlier it was a sandy taste, you know, because of the, the blast freezing options are not available now. Now people uh, can enjoy a, a proper ice cream, you know, like anywhere in the, in, in, in the, in the world. So like that, the industry, you know, now uh, with the sale of the, the, the walls factory to, to Cargill's, you know, the uh, so we uh, we went into manufacturing the car goes into manufacturing and we have a nine factories in a large manufacturing units you know uh, producing leading brands of uh, consumer goods and we have taken those uh, good practices you know uh, with us to the other factories on and uh, the industry has developed you know in, uh, and especially the consumers get uh, benefited you know so that's uh, the the I, I think the the industry in right path and uh, the the directions you know future uh, uh, future directions you know is the what we are looking at you know as, as a, a packaging solutions you know and uh, we had to reduce plastics you know uh, that is the the most important aspect you know in these these days 
and the look quality packaging because the the, we, the consumer pays you know a large amount of money for the for the packaging and uh, so we had to reduce that cost you know we had to find ways to do that and uh, we had to improve the shelf life you know and reduce the 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 preservatives you use you know to improve the shelf life by introducing various tactics such as you know hygienic practices and you know and the quality of raw materials has to be improved you know to they can reduce the 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 use of uh, preservatives in the in the final product so uh, the, the local solutions you know as you say you know what we really looking for is the packaging improvement solutions you know where uh, we can uh, uh, introduce uh, 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 biodegradable sustainable uh, uh, products uh, as packaging, you know, to uh, to uh, to reduce the, the the amount of plastics we use as as packaging, and uh, the raw material quality, you know, to improve the raw material quality, uh, uh, we are into uh, we are into a large uh, uh, dairy brand in Sri Lanka, and uh, we are one of the the largest milk collectors, you know, in in the island. So uh, we we collect a lot of milk, you know, from uh, from individual farmers. Where that's our policy of, you know. Uh, going into the the farmers, you know, to get the 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 money flow into them, you know, in in this dairy industry. So, so the raw material quality, you know, is 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 uh, the milk quality is, is plays a major part, you know, on on processing the milk, the initial initial bacterial quantity of the, in, in the milk. So, so these are the things, you know, which we really need the improvements, you know, to to improve the the industry. And the other sector, you know, which which I really uh, want to emphasize is the the waste management, you know, of, of our effluent treatment systems, and uh, we are more uh, more and more finding uh, challenges, you know, in the, the the waste management sector. You know, I can emphasize those things, you know, in in, in the the next session, you know, and then uh, we need help, we need the assistance, you know, guidance, you know, to uh, to uh, to, uh, to on this area where, where uh, as you know, the food manufacturing, you know, produce a lot of uh, uh, Effluent, you know, liquid effluent, and uh, we use a lot of water. You know, you can reduce the amount of water we use. You know, and uh, these all these sustainable uh, uh, goals. You know, we have. We want to achieve them with uh, with help. So uh, the local solutions. You know, what I can say is, you know, in these areas where we where where the universities can help us, and uh, the challenges, as you say, you know, the the uh, the same is uh, what we face, you know, the, the reduction of plastics, you know, and the energy costs, you know, and as you know, the, the, the industry, food industry, you know, use, uh, uh, is, is a very uh, energy consuming uh, industry where you need the refrigeration, especially to, to, uh, to keep the, the shelf life of the product, you know, during the processing also, you need refrigeration, you need steam for, for, for pasteurizing and things like that, you know, in dairy. So we, we want to have uh, uh, sustainable solutions, you know, to, for our energy usage and uh, to reduce the energy usage, you know, and the water consumption and the conservation, you know, we use various uh, practices, uh, rainwater collection and uh, RO system to reuse the effluent back as cooling water for our machinery. And uh, we need the trained, skilled, uh, tec technical uh, People, you know, to operate these systems, you know, that's also a, a challenge that we face, you know, in Sri Lanka nowadays. And because not many people are, are skilled people is, is available these days, you know, for, for these are very uh, highly skilled people uh, involved in, in this business. So, uh, uh, and the other thing, you know, disposal of effluent, you know, that's, that's also a major part, you know, and then, uh, as you said, you know, about the COVID uh, uh, time, you know, it is very interesting that, you know, uh, during the COVID times, the, the, especially the food, food, uh, food manufacturing industry was less uh, uh, affected, you know. I would say because uh, we used to, to, uh, to uh, practice uh, many hygienic practices, you know, once you, you know, the things are similar to, to what you do, you know, nowadays, you know, wearing masks and, you know, cleaning hands and, you know, and the people are trained to uh, to look after their personal hygiene, you know, especially inside the factory. So we have very strict uh, uh, hygienic systems, you know, practice, you know, in, within the factories, you know, where you have segregated the areas as per the hygienic levels. So the so people are used to these uh, hygienic practice. So by that, I think, you know, the 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 amount of in infections, you know, within the factories also was very less. 
so we were not really really affected you know by by the the covid situation so that is one one positive positive thing i can uh, uh, see you know and and uh, that that uh, uh, that improves the the product quality and you know that those standard as well uh, so that's what i can say you know from for the for the for the question you can ask you ask right right thank you very much uh, mr devakant a very insightful uh, touching upon very important aspect that the that is covid situation how we have managed because of you you had that culture you know that's something that we had to look into all these then when you are facing this global challenges you know we, we, we can't just come up with a new thing but it should be your culture you know you have to prepare for that so i think that's very interesting and also you highlight some of the key areas where we can collaborate i think that's an area probably all the areas like packaging and then look at waste management waste water treatment and those are also the areas we are working so as universities and and probably you need even the government and other partners to also get engaged so we'll see how we can go forward so we are looking at this partnership also with this but you can if you are looking at transferring our you know the results into the industry we need the partnering so i think that's a very good that insight for us to also think what are the areas we have to uh, concentrate thank you very much i will come back to you later you know with uh, when the time permits with maybe some few uh, ideas so uh, now for the first round we have now uh, going into the international you know expert hmm? professor noguchi uh, uh, why we selected him basically he has also had a earlier Uh, kind of a collaboration with the uh, sri lanka so he has i think some expert uh, you know exposure to that but more importantly this area like he started with agriculture i got engineering then moved into the food processing and and also went into i think uh, using looking at you know using this biomass uh, you know in a broader you know the 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 areas uh, you know bioenergy and so on this also very relevant to sri lanka uh, so 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 first i would like to hear from you uh, uh, professor naguchi uh, and now when you look at this uh, role of uh, research on social economic development in a country uh, because we know that uh, the, the japan has uh, you know tremendous uh, improvement to this type of a, you know the uh, the involvement with the universities and other thing and and also your own research experience in agriculture you know, and then going into food processing uh, and so on so uh, you can bring some of your own examples uh, there um so 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 uh, it's over to uh, professor naguchi thank you <laughs> thank you very much for the introducing me the professor susisa i'm very honored to invite the your research week university of monatua so i'd like to share my screen first Okay, my name is Ryodo Noguchi, and I'm belonging to the Faculty of Life and Environment Sciences, University of Tsukuba. And, uh, this faculty includes the Faculty of Agriculture, and I also the one of the member of the Department of Agriculture Engineering. So the so the I would like to introduce two research to, which related to the agriculture engineering field. So the this. Uh, this research theme was conducted when a research uh, sorry the uh, foreign student from the sri lanka uh, his name is the sri lanka ariyawanshak malage he is a researcher in the sugarcane research institute in sri lanka it is very interesting research because so he totally so sort of changing to the harvesting system from the field to the factory so that he will want to change to the uh, harvesting system not only the main part of the sugarcane but also the waste part of the biomass finally so that he proposed the hydrothermal liquefaction htl processing to produce a bio crude finally the biofuel in the uh, factory of sugarcane mill factory uh, mill factories so anyway so that this kind of the new a uh, farming system will provide not only the high quality the sugar the increasing the total amount of sugar but also the uh, energy and the materials in the factory so the, this is very interesting uh, the research and i am very honored to conduct research with him i still i'm contacting with him and to, to we now considering to the next our future research and this second the my research topic is the bioremediation and the biofuel production of uh, my microalgae 
as you know, microalgae are very high potential to produce the uh, uh, fat and uh, lipid to, in their body. So the uh, we uh, just trying to develop the uh, facility uh, planning to the how to extract to, how to extract the fat and lipid from their body by using the hydrothermal reaction and then the same uh, processing in a sugarcane meal factory. But anyway, so the, this uh, after the uh, some of the research we found, so the nutrient in the water is very important to and to decrease the total cost of the biofuel production by microalgae. So now we are considering to the this microalgae cultivation for waste water treatment in the municipal and also the POMI, palm oil meal effluent in Indonesia. So finally, so we can dramatically decrease the cost of the nutrient for the microalgae. I think that we have to, uh, we have to consider not to only seek the energy, but also we have to, how to manage the biomass, the waste biomass. So the, at my former presenter, so the Mr. Devan Kanta said, so the waste management is an important role in the food industry. I totally agree about it. So that we have to consider the waste management and uh, producing the bioenergy is one of the strategy. In Japan, so that we seek the, the waste water management too much. So recently, the one of the newspaper said there are no nutrients in the sea. So the bacteria and plankton cannot be survived no more so that without the nutrient. So the too much the management of the waste water is not good for the nutrient for the plankton and finally the fish. So we have to consider the, how to manage the waste water controlling and the nutrient control in the uh, nature. Okay, that's all the first question uh, from you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Naguchi. Uh, very insightful. I will come back to you because we want to learn more from your experience, especially you know how you uh, you know collaborate with the uh, industry, government, and so on. That's the follow-up yeah. question. I will come back to you. Thank you very much. That is very insightful, and especially this topic you bring biomass. You know, in Sri Lanka, that's you know the one of the main of course, main source of energy in Sri Lanka, especially for industry, you know, food processing yes. and other industry biomass. But we are using very conventional technologies, you know, direct thermal, you know, those things only. And, and therefore we have waste of resource as well as, you know, even, even, even uh, you know, residues and so on. So we have not moved into this high tech thing, like, you know, going mm -hmm. for this, uh, you know, the gasification or pyrolysis, yeah. you know, it's still lacking. And, but I see that we do research. Even our university, we have a, a, a department, Department of Chemical and Process Engineering. They are doing uh, biofuel, uh, this uh, microagri, uh, you know, this uh, biofuel generation and so on. So I see uh, a lot of opportunities for we, we to collaborate too. That's, you know, uh, one to one thing. But then we need to see, you know, how you manage as a country, as a university, how you do manage the other stakeholders, the participants. So that that will like, come back. Uh, so, so this is the first round of discussion that we have got uh, quite a you know good insight in all the areas. So, uh, so I'm going to just capture those. Basically, uh, Dr. Himan uh, basically indicated the present situation, the downward trend in our industry. That's an alarming thing. That's the backbone, basically, especially for rural economy. Uh, this sector uh, has been contributing a lot, but now we have a challenge there. I think that's one of the very you know uh, you know uh, alarming you know. I think we see, but then of course on the other side, uh, there are solutions. What you see from the industry, we can see how the food industry has evolved, especially through the technological interventions, uh, with uh, novel concepts, and also they are looking at though the context of sustainability. You know the word sustainability repeatedly we hear. Uh, so so therefore uh, I think uh, and then international experience so that uh, how uh, strong the powerful the research are. Uh, and even across the board, so the board, you know, so the, the border, so that's very interesting. Uh, so so uh, I will, also, because of time limit, uh, we have only 10 minutes uh, more. Uh, I think most of the questions we have answered, so I don't have many additional questions. But Mr. Devakant, very quickly, uh, to kind of see what way forward uh, from the industrial side, uh, you know, now, now to cooperate with the industry, there are challenges, you know, sometimes we don't understand 
uh, the, the industrial need. Maybe sometimes you don't understand industry problem properly. You know, we do some research, it may not be relevant to the industry too. So what's your opinion, Mr. Devakant, whether presently our university are significantly contributing to the industry or especially your industry, or still we don't have that type of a, you know, of course we can have you know few things, but not uh, sufficient. What's your opinion on that? And then how to go forward? You know how we can collaborate with uh, you all, maybe in your industry. Thank you. So, Mr. Devakant, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. You know, I wanted uh, this question to be asked. You know, because uh, over the past years, you know, maybe about 10, 15 years, you know, we had a lot of interaction with the universities, especially Bharat University with Doctor Ajit's uh, incubation. Uh, uh, system and uh, and uh, but you know uh, i'm sorry to say that you know nothing uh, uh, nothing very productive or conclusive uh, thing came came up and uh, and it is actually you know is both parts uh, both parties has to be uh, responsible for that you know because uh, uh, without any any uh, any uh, emphasis on on taking it forward uh, as dr imam says you know all the npd we have we have uh, given a lot of ideas for the NPD work, you know, but uh, they 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 tend to stop somewhere, you know, and then nobody has taken it forward. And uh, so the the even now, you know, we have a, a person, you know, very I mean, a very senior person appointed from the group to to deal with the with the universities and you know take this you know uh, this forward, you know, with Perajin University, Runa, uh, Sabragamu, and uh, Javadinapura is all uh, is involved in this. And uh, they are doing various new product development, organic agriculture projects, you know, dairy development, uh, things like that. So these are the things, you know, which from our side, you know, we 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 try to uh, to uh, to coordinate this, you know, by not uh, trying to do with the individual factories. So there's a person that now is coordinating things with the university, so then we can go forward. Earlier, the, the proper coordination was not there. So the, the other thing, you know, what I wanted, you know, really, I, I, I have a very pressing need, like, you know, as, as, as I, I said earlier, uh, the effluent the treatment, you know, now uh, in, in dairy that, you know, we do uh, uh, chemical separation of fat initially, you know, from um, after that, you know, it goes to the normal uh, anaerobic and aerobic digestion process. So this uh, chemically separated fat, you know, is called it DAP. You know, as we have to dispose it. You know, so we dispose it through uh, through uh, uh, normal sewage treatment plants in Sri Lanka, uh, and they they just uh, mix it with the with the with the sewage, and you know, they pump it to sea. Basically, you know, now uh, you now the the, uh, the the environmental pollution units, you know, have, have come up come up, you know, with uh, various findings, you know, so they wanted to stop that. So the, we have a big problem, you know, the dairy industry uh, of what to do with the debt plant. So I have a, a solution, you know, with a German uh, a company. They they do uh, these biomass uh, boilers, you know, then we can uh, dewater the the the, uh, the fat starch, you know, and then mix it with other uh, combustible material and then burn it and then uh, produce energy, you know, steam. So for that, you know, I need the calorific value of the of the product that we have, you know, the so that you know, we I don't have any place to, to get that calorific value. So the the industry, the, the new cities can help. So though we have given this uh, problem to uh, to this person that uh, to get uh, uh, connected with the university and find out this calorific value like that. You know, so, so many uh, so many uh, instances. You know, where we need uh, your your direct uh, uh, participation. You know, uh, and and uh, the, the package development, uh, NPD. You know, and and, and things like that. So, but so far, you know, I, I'm sorry to say that, you know, we, we haven't uh, uh, come across, you know, uh, use the, the facilities and the know-how of the universities uh, effectively uh, for the industry. And the industry, as you know, uh, Dr. Ida, is also a little bit, you know, uh, protective type, you know, they don't want to, to, to open up, you know, because it, it is very competitive environment. Mm -hmm. So the new product development uh, tends to be a secret of, of individual uh, uh, manufacturing facilities. So that's also, you know, is an area that we wanted to solve things, you know, that way. And uh, um, like that, you know, this uh, the, the challenges are the, to to have a better coordination, you know. And uh, as Dr. Iman says, you know, that uh, the the new products that develop you know, stays in the in their lab, you know, and then it doesn't go to production. But anyway, the the the, the things comes to production is also not very not very practical in the industrial environment to 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 do. 
and uh, so we can exchange people you know your people you know come and study our processes and then then take back those information you know and then uh, develop something you know, like that uh, we can work closely with Marutu and and uh, so we 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 uh, we hoping to have a lot of interaction in in the future that uh, that I wanted to uh, to emphasize that uh, this uh, this yeah. fact yeah right right well, thank you very much to be open for we also understand that and then we also take some uh, you know initiated to set up some centralized you know uh, unit to coordinate so we have what you call unit to business linkage cell now uh, so that i think we are in a better position to coordinate and and, and and look at your need you know because you know also that know that we, when we work with the industry also sometimes you know the projects are like in one or two years it will not go into final results so that's what we discussed so that the topic today also I think that's a very insightful thing. I think that need is here. I think you have been very open, uh, open telling the certain situation. So that's very important. I think we'll go forward in that one. This forum basically targeting that type of, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, I find the needs and then, you know, looking forward to contribute to that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Devakant. Uh, then uh, now we have very limited, maybe three minutes more. Uh, I want to go now go into uh, uh, person Noguchi. I think you have touched upon this, but then as a kind of a final conclusion, now uh, how uh, this university uh, government industry partnership, you know, how it works in, in, in Japan, anything we can learn from uh, us because we have now heard our side, like uh, the university, the industry, you see we have gaps. So any comment on that uh, person Noguchi? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the important thing is how to make a consortia over the research group, including not only the university, but also the research, uh, research institute, government sectors, and private sectors. So after the making a consortium, we can submit any kind of the budget. So the this is one. Uh, this is one of the special case, the JSPS. This is a very academic. So we can collaborate with the university to university using this kind of the budget. Mm. Right. Sorry. And uh, this is a very, uh, as you know, so the satraps is a very imp uh, the big budget, and which not uh, just uh, cooperate with JICA, Japan in International Cooperation Agency, and the J JST, Japanese Scientific and uh, Technology Agency, and the university and the private company. So we make a such kind of a consortium, both countries, Japan and uh, as example, the Sri Lanka, we can submit this kind of the budget. This budget not only the uh, to providing the technology and uh, uh, developing the technology each other, but the, also that we can uh, to educate the PhD student that are in the your side, because uh, because that the next generation they are very important to promote and to the cultivate these technologies. So if I have a chance, I'd like to submit and apply the satellites uh, project. You can see these keywords and you can check the what kind of the project is running in Sri Lanka now. And there are so several, so the budget in our country, uh, this is one of the uh, budget, the SIP, uh, and this is the budget under the National Agriculture Research Organization, Ministry of Agriculture. And I now are conducting to the autonomous spraying system and other one uh, just uh, the con uh, checking the, the environment the damage, uh, sorry, uh, the environment evaluations, the biomass heating. Uh, using the rice husk without human their health risk. But anyway, so that these kind of the budget cannot get by only one professor, one faculty. So after the making the consortium or the research group, we can easily to apply. So the important thing is how to develop, uh, how to make uh, such kind of the group of the research and the project group. And, and then we easily to challenge it. That's my uh, opinion for getting the budget and to cooperate in near future. Right. Thank uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Nag uh, uh, Professor Naguchi. I, that's what we need basically, like, because uh, that's what we really lack. Like, you know, multi-stakeholder partnership, multi-discipline research, and it's not just money, as you said. You know, we had to have platform uh, this type of approach to do that. So thank you very much. That's uh, given uh, full uh, the insight to this discussion.
Yeah. Unfortunately, we have now consumed <laughs> our time. Uh, 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 Dr. Iman, very quickly, I'm not going to have any conclusion because you have done the conclusion there. Just one sentence, uh, Dr. Iman, you have come up with that uh, model also. You can just conclude with that. Uh, so, uh, so with that, we can conclude this session. Thank you. Uh, you are muted. Uh, you are muted. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. This, uh, this, uh, uh, I will show or reference that this sums up the the entire discussion. In fact, mm -hmm. because uh, we need uh, multi-party collaboration, we need foreign collaborations, uh, we need the industry uh, to participate, we need the uh, funding agencies to work together, and we need. Uh, at large, we need government assistance. And also we need to, in terms of policy making, we need to push the government to take the right decisions. So, and in order to do, do something like that, we need to have a uh, collaborative or uh, uh, concerted effort in order to propose things, product, product in terms of product development and uh, taking it to the finishing level and also taking it to the intended uh, users. So we need to, as a university, we need to work together. All the departments, all the faculties need to work together in a single entity. That's how the collaboration needs to start. start. And then uh, the industry will have confidence, foreign universities will have confidence, and also the funding agencies will have confidence in working with us in order to uh, in order to reap the benefits of uh, the knowledge base that we have at the university. So that's the sole intention of proposing this uh, entity called Farmer uh, to the university. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think you have done the conclusive part. I don't have to repeat again uh, because of time. I will uh, stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Naguchi, uh, coming from Japan. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Devakant, uh, you know, from the industry, and of course, uh, Dr. Himan highlighting our side. It is very fruitful discussion. I think this is starting of then. We'll com uh, communicate with you all, uh, of course, Naguchi, Devakant, uh, all, and with, with this whole group, I think, and to see what we can go, go uh, way forward. So I think we understand the importance of uh, the research research going into the industry and the way we had to do it. And that we have best practices also coming from, uh, for example, Japan. So, and also, uh, the way the industry has evolved. So all are very positive point for us to act, I think. So therefore, I think the major initiative should come from the university side. And, and we hope that uh, individually as well as, as a you know, uh, university in, 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 as a group uh, and entity will take uh, you know positive action uh, to make a reality. So so this session uh, will be uh, you know concluded with that. So thank you very much. Thank you for your collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Pala for moderating that very engaging session. Uh, it was indeed a very interesting and uh, insightful session, I must say. Um, so, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot of negatives and challenges uh, as uh, mentioned uh, initially by Dr. Punjheva. But uh, it makes you think that it is certain things are possible as well, given the certain uh, 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 proposals which came out of the discussion, such as the farm initiative, uh, as well as a number of uh, hygienic practices, as well as the good practices that uh, our food processing industry has had, as uh, Mr. Devakant mentioned, as well as the uh, interesting new methods uh, which were proposed by uh, Professor Naguchi uh, as our international expert. So it makes you think that it is possible indeed, right? With that note, I would like to go on to a few messages from our sponsors, um, and I will hand over to uh, the technical team uh, to uh, display those messages, and I will come back.
uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have another session on store for you um, after this, uh, which will be themed bridging academia and practice towards sustainable development. This will focus on the area of energy, infrastructure, cities, and transportation. Uh, this will be moderated by uh, Dr. Milinda Patiraja, who is a senior lecturer from the Faculty of Architecture, Department of Architecture. Over to you, Dr. Milinda Patiraja, to commence the session and introduce the panel. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, second panel discussion we are holding as part of the Global Research Forum. Um, just give me a second. I think I should be able to uh, share a slide. So, uh, uh, my name is Melinda. And in this session, uh, we are focusing on the thematic ideas of energy construction and cities. And to contribute to this panel discussion, uh, we have invited three prominent gentlemen uh, who I'm sure are no strangers to our university fraternity. So I'm going to uh, introduce them very frugally, uh, very briefly, partly because we don't have a lot of time um, to spend on this discussion, but also because they are very well known uh, personalities. Um, so we have Dr. Priyanta Vijaytunga, who is uh, currently the chief of the energy sector group at Asian Development Bank. But as we all know, he uh, is, a, is a former senior professor of electrical engineering at the University of Moratua and the first dean of faculty of uh, information technology. Dr. Vijaytunga was the founding director general of the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka. And uh, a former president of the Sri Lanka Energy Managers Association, among many, many positions he held before moving to ADB. He was also a lead author of the Sri Lanka Energy Policies and Strategies compilation, which uh, they did in the year 2007 and 2008. Uh, he also involved in the drafting of the Electricity Act in 2009 and the Sustainable Energy Authority Act in 2007. And at ADB, uh, he served as the director of the South Asia Energy Division uh, before he was appointed to this uh, highest position, uh, you know, chief of uh, the ADB energy sector operations. Then we have Dr. Rohan Karnaratna, who is the current uh, president of the Ceylon Institute of Builders. He's also the managing director of AKK Engineers, the chairman of Master Builders International, the chairman of Apico Finance, again, among many, many positions that he holds, uh, both internationally as, as well as locally. Uh, he's also the past chairman of the National Construction Association. So he has over 30 years of experience in the construction industry, both as a practitioner, as, as well as a teacher, but as well as an administrator. Um, Dr. Karunaratna holds a PhD in management um, and, uh, and he also has been lecturing in civil construction, designing and planning uh, at, at an academic level. And then uh, to round up the panel, uh, we have in, invited Mr. D.B. Navaratna. Uh, Mr. Ra Navaratna is a leading chartered architect and an urban designer uh, with postgraduate qualifications on both. Director at the Design Consortium Limited, a senior fellow, uh, fellow and a, I guess a uh, a leading contributor uh, to the Sri Lanka Institute of Architects, especially um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a long running member of SLIA's Board of Architectural Education. And, uh, and Mr. Navaratna is also the incumbent industry representative at the Architecture Faculty's Academic Board. So I welcome the three gentlemen on behalf of the University of Moratua. The way we intend to conduct this session is uh, that I will first very briefly outline the theme of the objectives of our discussion today. And then we will invite the panel members to spend uh, roughly about five, six minutes 
reflecting on a couple of issues that they think are critical to the current behavior, as well as the future directions of the sector that they are involved in, but also with an emphasis on possible R&D works, as well, you know, R&D works that could eventually extend into a national uh, policy making level. And then we'll move into a, a Q&A session. Um, as you can see here, you have titled this session as Bridging Academia and Practice Towards Sustainable Development. And I believe the title itself sort of explores the two important issues that we intend to tackle within this uh, 45 minutes. Uh, firstly, by referring to the term bridging the academia and practice and by extension, academia and industry, we want to look at the role the academia can play in building up industry partnerships to trigger socially and uh, I guess nationally relevant R&D works. And secondly, by referring to this notion of sustainability, um, we want to reflect on possible research areas and aims that could lead into a broader national and global objective, especially, especially at, the, at, the, at the policy making level. But, uh, but we all know that you know, this idea of sustainability is often a problematic. You know, sometimes it's, it's a term that is, I guess, thrown around loosely these days and uh, has become kind of a catchphrase for many different cultural and political associations. At the same time, it's also a phenomenon that we can't simply run away from, you know, judging by the global climate uh, change challenges, um, I guess the impending energy crisis, um, even in the context of how, how our cities are failing, both culturally and environmentally, and even you know, within the process of how the environment is being destroyed by the broad activities of construction. So the term sustainability is referred here strategically I guess as a way of bringing together these four thematic areas we are supposed to deal with at the panel discussion, energy, infrastructure, cities, and construction, simply as an opportunity to trigger a multidisciplinary discussion, but not in the context of its, I guess, you know, the typical environmental sentiments. So sustainability here refers to, a, I guess, a possible balance between economic growth on one hand, social improvement and environmental protection as a kind of a mutually reinforcing dimensions of development. So to that in inquiring how to sustain people, how to sustain industries and how to sustain ways of life becomes as important as the need of sustaining the ecological fabric. So that, in that sense, I guess, um, the governance of energy sector, for example, becomes as important as the safe extraction of natural resources for energy production. Protecting the socio-cultural life of the people within the city becomes as important as the political economy that governs city building. And the conditions of the workers in the construction sector becomes as important as the distribution of professional work in the industry. So uh, within this broader definition of sustainability, we would like to discuss possible areas of uh, research and design investigations that uh, perhaps we need to take up um, uh, uh, collectively, both in a shorter and longer terms. And perhaps in that process also to discuss, I guess, the failings or the inadequacies of you know, state level responses to the targeted sustainable development goals uh, uh, you know, along the sectors that, that we are focusing here. So with that note, uh, I will uh, move into the first briefing of the session by the panel members. Uh, I hope Dr. Priyanka Vijaytunga is here. I, di I didn't, uh, um, yes, yes, uh, Dr. Vijaytunga is here. Um, so uh, um, so I, I first invite uh, Dr. Vijaytunga to reflect on the, I guess the, the context and challenges of promoting cleaner and energy efficient technologies um, and governance of the energy sector, you know, the things that uh, Dr. Vijay Tunga has been advocating for a very long time. Um, and even with the ADP, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, investigations uh, you have been doing, you know, uh, concerns about uh, exploring cross-border power trading, you know, India, Sri Lanka, submarine link, and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, Please, Dr. Vijay Tunga, we would like to hear more about the, 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 the research content of such work. So I, I open the, uh, the, the, the forum to you. Uh, 
Hello. Is your mic on? Um, Dr. Vijayatan, are you there? Okay. Uh, Dr. Vijayatan, I think your mic is off. Can I? Uh, um, sorry, Mr. I am back. My uh, internet connection is uh, not stable. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Yeah. So welcome, welcome back to uh, the university, and and welcome to this forum as well, uh, Dr. Vijayan. No worries. <laughs> Anyway, I followed you. I missed maybe a couple of minutes in between. That's it. All right. Okay. Uh, so, um, so we uh, we are just uh, waiting to hear from you, Dr. Vijay Dunga. Uh, okay. You know, just uh, a few minutes, uh, five six minutes. You know, just a briefing on um, you know few issues that you find critical at this juncture, especially in terms of uh, renewable energy and so on and so on. You know, in line of uh, possible future R and D works. Yeah. Yeah, Melinda. First of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this this uh, important uh, webinar. Uh, it's quite nice because uh, you know after leaving academia, coming back to talking to academia is always good, and you feel good. And uh, uh, so, um, by the way, my my uh, voice may be choppy because of the internet connection, but I hope uh, you can still follow, uh, even with a little, little bit of uh, breaking in between. So, uh, being coming from the energy sector, and energy sector, as all as you quite rightly said, uh, cut across all other sectors, and you need energy for everything. And uh, when it comes to sustainability, energy plays a very important role. Now it's even more highlighted uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, we have to address these climate change challenges. So that's why all these countries are now looking at energy sector. How, uh, very closely how energy sector will be developed as as uh, you know in, in in times to come as you know uh, recently uh, they concluded the cop 26 conference of parties 26 uh, meeting and uh, there were very ambitious goals uh, set for uh, you know uh, the countries around the world uh, cleaning up, to clean up their uh, energy sectors and that's very very important so uh, if you take sri lanka we cannot uh, go against the tide if I start off with this. You cannot go on arguing whether we haven't, uh, whether we have adequate power uh, and whether we have base load power enough, whether we have had enough coal power plants, uh, natural gas power plants and all that. Uh, you, I think we, we, have, we have to move away from that kind of thinking. I myself is an electrical engineer. I know how a power system works. I know the importance of having a base load plans and a peak load plan, that separation, that distinction. Uh, I know how to handle it. But whether we like it or not, we have come to a point, sustainability matters. Simply because, of course, it mattered throughout, but now it's even more uh, than before because of the climate change challenges. So it's time that we seriously look at the energy cleaning up of the energy sector. It's not just what we are going to do in the future, but also what we have already done, we need to clean up. We have already uh, 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 got uh, you know, a certain percentage of thermal power plants here. We have 900 megawatts of coal sitting there, uh, which we uh, could have avoided actually at one point or the other. Now, of course, we are looking at natural gas, which is supposed to be a transitional fuel. So overall, we have to look at the power sector very, very carefully, energy sector as a whole too. And, and see how we can move away as much as possible uh, from fossil fuels. Of course, it has a cost. And as an upper middle income country, we should be able to bear certain costs, even, even uh, uh, with great difficulties we are going through now. So uh, I think uh, from energy sector viewpoint, we have to seriously look at uh, you know, clean energy interventions 
uh, and I know uh, the Sri Lanka has a has a policy already, uh, you know, to have 70% of the of the energy sector power sector at least 70% coming from renewable energy sources by 2030. So we should plan and look uh, work work towards it. That's very important. Uh, so in that regard, academia has a very important role to play. What can it do? What can it do? Now, when it comes to intermittent, uh, most of the renewable energy sources are intermittent, whether we like it or not, wind, solar, all are, um, they, they are available when they are, when not at the time that you would like to have them sometimes. So but what it means is that you have to adjust your power system performance, uh, power system operations to suit those intermittency. And, and that uh, can be done only by looking at certain technologies and the behavior of the power systems and to accommodate these intermittent sources accordingly. So that kind of uh, study is obviously part of acad academic work. And, and we used to do that right throughout, uh, you know, in our research career. So you need to look at those things. That's a very important fact. Now today, if, if, I, if I may tell you, I have uh, two consultants working uh, for Sri Lanka, looking exactly at that, that uh, particular aspect of it, how to accommodate 70% are renewables in our power system, but what needs to be done in terms of, uh, you know, adjusting uh, the power system operations and uh, the technologies required and so on and so forth. So these are things what academic uh, academia can, can uh, chip in and, and do a lot of work with. For that, you need to have very close collaboration with, with the, uh, the, uh, the players in the power, power sector, particularly the Ceylon Electricity Board, Laka Electricity Company, our major players, you have to work with them. I'm sure our colleagues in electrical engineering work very closely with them and they have to work even more closely and, and they have to be proactive, not reactive and, uh, and, and work on those things. So these are just a few thoughts I have at the moment. What we need to, uh, the emphasis is it's clean energy, nothing else, whether we like it or not, and we have to work on it and how to accommodate it as much as possible. Um, right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijay uh, I will just ask one question before we move to uh, perhaps Dr. Karnaratna. I mean, you mentioned about, uh, you know, this aim of, uh, you know, the government having Sri Lanka becoming self-sufficient by energy in energy in 2030. And, uh, uh, and they want to increase the power generation capacity uh, of almost about, I guess, 3000 megawatts from current 4000 something by 2025 and as you said to uh, depend on renewable energy but despite these long term plans you know we had power outages in 2018 in 2019 and in, even in 2020 perhaps because that you know we have this sort of less predictable weather patterns which sort of impact hydropower generation but the government keeps saying that they are working on lng import facilities uh, you know also uh, you know regasification units and so on and so on but my question is that, uh, do you think these targets are, you know, especially, you know, cleaner energy, are, are they realistic? I you know within, a, you know, the social and political context of a country like ours and, uh, and what are the barriers if you, if you, if you think that, you know, uh, that would not be the case? Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, that's, that's a very good question, Melinda. In fact, um, you know, you have to be realistic as an engineer. Uh, I mean, I myself is an engineer. So, uh, but at the moment, if I may tell you, the technologies are there to accommodate 70% renewables by 2030. But the issue is what the cost uh, is going to be. So it's a cost and, and uh, benefit uh, and your targets. Uh, it's, a, it's a balance between all these different factors. And, and, and whether we can afford it. My, my uh, feeling is that 2030 is uh, nine years away. Uh, away. And uh, if you look at the technological development in, in renewable energy, it's enormous and it's, uh, it's exponential development. The cost reductions are exponential and the technology developments are exponential and the flexibility needed in the power system to accommodate uh, you know, such uh, you know, variable renewable energy is enormous. So, my feeling is that we can we can do it. The power uh, failures in the past are obviously not uh, not having adequate uh, uh, generation, uh, not having adequate transmission strengthening. Maybe no, those are things which we need to address. Of course, of course, we need uh, funding for that. And keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if you are talking of funding, 
right? And you have to look at where you get the funding from. So international financing uh, has already dried up and, and, and is drying up for fossil fuels. Not only fossil fuels, I may not be able to find a fund, a transmission line connected to a fossil fuel plant in the future. In, in ADB, we may not be able to finance it. Even a transmission line connected to a fossil fuel, no, for, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, forget about a uh, power plant itself. So international financing is drying up for fossil fuels, whether we like it or not. So we need to move, move towards clean energy. It's possible, all of us, all the stakeholders, not just one or two, Everybody, uh, you know, who is going to benefit from energy and who is going to chip in uh, and provide these energy services, everybody have to work together and work towards it and, and that target. So I, I told my consultants, don't ask whether we can accommodate this or not. You should find ways of accommodating it and see what technologies should be brought in and how it can be done. And the CEB will do it. We'll have to do it. That's part of policymaking process. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Tunga. Um, so with that note, I'll, I'll move to Dr. Karna Ratna. Uh, if you, if you uh, may, Dr. Karna Ratna, if you can briefly talk about perhaps present challenges uh, and possible way forward uh, in the construction industry, you know, perhaps focusing on issues like, uh, I, I think, I mean, we all know that, you know, within the the, you know, the current pandemic situation, there's a um, problem of uh, not having enough work, uh, high construction costs and so on and so on. But going forward, um, in, you know, with the, um, you know, reflection on R&D work, um, you know, issues about, uh, you know, tender procedures, issues about, um, you know, workmanship, training of workers and so on and so on. So if you can just uh, um, uh, 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 dig some points uh, which we can sort of gather uh, as, as a possible extensions to uh, over to you Dr. Karnaratna. Thank you Melinda. Uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. First of all let me thank University of Moratua uh, for inviting me to your global, global research forum uh, focusing on sustainable development. Okay my, my topic is actually the way forward in the construction industry and the crisis we are facing at the moment. Uh, let me let me explain you how big our industry is and uh, what are the problems we got to face in next two years. Uh, we contribute uh, around 9.6 percent in uh, 2014. We have contributed 9.6 percent to the GDP. And even now, we contribute about 67% to the GDP and about around 1 million people are working in our industry. So, so last year budget, the government has announced, uh, announced some massive projects like uh, 100,000 kilometer road project, uh, 10,000 into three highway projects, 10,000 bridges, 500,000 water supply uh, projects, the construction of 100,000 houses and the private sector project like Port City, BIA, hospital, schools, parks, etc. Out of which this budget, they have announced that the government sector buildings are, uh, they are going to stop. So we roughly calculated the, our 1,000 billion worth of work per annum. If we do 1,000 billion worth per annum, we can contribute around 10% to the GDP. But if they bring it down to 600 billion, GDP also will come down to about 6%. So that's the one of the economical effect to the GDP. And the other way is very bad uh, because there are 650,000 workers are working in our industry. So even the poorest laborer in our country is working for us. So those people may not have uh, jobs. Uh, if the if the workload has come down to 600 billion. so i uh, we strongly when uh, we are discussing with the, with the even they stopped the government buildings yes it's fine that's fine they got to do that but the thing is you have to encourage the private sector projects to be come up in the country and also the funded projects to be brought into the country so to match this gap is very 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 important so uh, we know there are major players in our game. These architects, we have over 1,500 architects in the industry. We have 17,000 engineers. 
2,000 quantity surveyors, and we have 3,800 registered contractors in Sri Lanka, and 1,200 non-registered contractors. Uh, our SME sector is very, very, very important and very, very, very strong because the 75% of the construction company, uh, the SME sector companies uh, are there. They employ 45% of the uh, employees. 45% of the employment are being given by the, given by the SME sector. So uh, in the construction sector, uh, 4,000, we have 4,000 contractors in the SME sector. So those people surviving of those people to support those people are very, very, very important because they need only 250 to 300 billion worth of work to survive in our industry. The issues, issues, more than the issues, we were really happy when this new government come out, come into the power because we have been discussing if the government were able to uh, uh, pay the due payments of 251 billion to the contractors. Uh, so, the government had paid that. So, uh, people were very happy and we got the moratorium loans. All the things were there. Uh, but now we are facing again a massive problem. The payments are being delaying in the industry. The work is going to be less for next two years. The competitive biddings are coming up now. The, the foreign uh, companies have become a real threat to the local construction industry. And the unrealistic uh, cost estimates are there? We don't know how some foreign contractors like Chinese are going to do that for that price. The biggest two problems we have these days is price escalation because of due to the uh, due to the lack of material in our industry. So uh, we are being discussing. Even yesterday we had a very lengthy discussion with the CEDA about the price escalation. So they have agreed at least for one year from this particular year, from January to pay us price escalation. All the, all the materials have been uh, gone up because we don't know how it is going up. It's, it's uh, very. We have started uh, 160,000 rupees a ton of steel. Now it's about 400, 410, 420,000. So it's gone up by uh, almost double and some are uh, more. So uh, next two years is very, very critical. If the government didn't pay the price escalation, give the contractor the time extension, and the if they come, even now some officers, some consultants are reducing, reducting the LD, liquidated damage. So we have requested the government not to please not to do all this because the, 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 the keeping contractors intact, saving them is a, it, it a big saving for the country because we are one of the biggest GDP contributor to the, to the construction industry. Uh, so, so even the uh, in, under my topic, there's a green building. Green building. We're happy to say, year 2010, we have our institute had started uh, giving green building certificates to our green uh, buildings. That's called green mark. Mm. But now, uh, uh, private sector was very interesting. A lot of private sector people have applied for that, and they have done a lot of green buildings in the country. But the government, yes, we have agreed with the government. All the UDA projects should be projects but i think now with these all these crises and things like that we uh, those doses are not there anymore in the tender so it's not a happy situation i think government has should, should seriously look at these uh, green buildings to be come up in our country because we are the people who are spoiling 40 percent of the uh, energy in our country i think it covers my <laughs> it's, uh, in the, <laughs> thank you very much thank you dr karata i'm just uh... I, I will just, you know, ask you a brief question. I mean, just to summarize what you have done. I, I guess, you know, um, where does the research potential uh, in all these complexities that are there, uh, there in the cons construction um, text? I mean, perhaps you know, you, you spoke about cost escalations and you know, even uh, you know, the uh, uh, the performance of building systems and so on. Perhaps alternative materials. Um, yeah. and uh, or, or different procurement uh, systems that the industry is using. So can you just reflect on that uh, 
uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Karatna, that that uh, you know, um, how do we sort of overcome some of these challenges through perhaps you know academic industrial uh, R and D work? Where is the research component in this? In this? Uh, maybe the, that is one of the areas we are really, really, really lacking. I mean, uh, we are not, our major problem in the construction industry is we are not with the universities or we are not working with high professionals to do R&D. Our guys may be, uh, we are very, we, we may be very wrong in this manner. We, our uh, contractors are only interested in doing their work and getting their money and go. They don't interest they, uh, to do researchers or, or green buildings or sustainability. So this is the this is the gap we should fill it up. So we have been discussing with the government to include at least a paragraph in our bill of quantities to improve your improve your green greenery in the buildings, sustainability, and the to be material uh, local material be used. So those areas we have been discussing in the government, but this particular era we are just trying to survive. So therefore, these two years I don't think any improvement will come. Yeah, but yeah. universities, but universities, they should definitely support the industry. We are the only institute, CIOB, the only institute working with the University of Morotu on the World Construction Symposium. So we bring down a lot of experts. We are, and we are in these particular three days of uh, workshop, we are introducing various research and development products in the country. So that is one of the very great events been happening in this country. I think that is the only event is happening in between the academia and the industry people. We have proposed to start to manufacturing 200 uh, factory to uh, locally manufacture our needs of the material. So uh, finance minister agreed this, but I don't know how long will this will take. Hmm? But this is very, very important if the government support them and expedite manufacturing uh, these items locally. I think we, we are we are kind of winning the, the, the why our construction cost is very high, that is because of the taxes we are paying for the imported metal. If we can manufacture those things here at a low cost, our construction cost can come down and we can be in par with the India and Bangladesh. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Karnaratna. So uh... I will then move to uh, um, Aratna, if you may, um, you know, address the forum briefly on your reflections on, I guess, critical issues um, in terms of city planning at local level, but also you know, your reflection on R&D, uh, and, and especially, you know, the, the process of integrated design, integrated design research, I guess. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Belinda, for inviting me and uh, inviting for this forum, which is uh, very interesting and um, very sort of a new approach uh, taken by University of Morotu, and I congratulate on this. Uh, and without uh, taking much time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, you'll be in a few minutes, like four minutes, uh, 3.45, I'll finish. Uh, that is a few points that I would like to uh, point out on the research aspect of energy. Uh, point number one is that, say very sadly, but truly, in Sri Lankan context, the economic policies and physical planning policies are not interconnected. So due to that, what has happened was that we have engaged in some of the physical uh, developments and spending money uh, and energy and everything. Uh, and then we say results that we are getting are not equivalent or not supportive the total development or they are not showing feasible solutions. So, uh, number one research that one should do is at the national level because physical planning, planning and uh, then uh, development, urban development and planning is an important factor because uh, whatever the economic development targets that you put and that is ultimately going to be built or get changed the physical structure of it. But unfortunately, this has not been happening because policies are made in different forums at different levels, but their integration with the physical planning process of it is lacking. So I would like, say, if somebody takes a research to see 
how much is this integration is done how much effective is it and at the end of the day at, at the end of every year of financial year that we should see how much of these physical contributions physical developments done are contributing to the economy financially or economically socially or culturally that's one point second point then it's from the national policy level next one comes into the urban investment level uh, that is the infrastructure that we are talking in one uh, one side that is roads uh, all that uh, say what uh, uh, dr priyanta talked about everything and then on the other side we have a building industry which is connected to architecture and the spatial planning of the city itself the urban development so in this uh say i think uh, we'll have to find answers in the local level as well of course uh as uh, dr priyanta said there are technological development which we cannot avoid and but there are several other aspects uh, which we can discuss uh we will see that where that local answers could be found uh, which are much cheaper uh in doing that say the urban contexts going into nights and night activities which is not happening in most of the cities of sri lanka uh, are we going to promote it or why should we promote it and cultural and social and all those problems uh third one in architectural sense i think the research must go on because uh, all the design processes are very much linear uh in our teaching as well as in education system that is how we have learned that is why dr priyanta is in one sector and i am in another sector and you are in another sector and we all in different sectors but if the time has come to bring a sustainable development into life then that is the point that we will have to integrate all this energy sociology history everything culture everything to get together to give the design answer ultimately because there is give and take each department has to do that is from energy department might have to take something then the cultural department have to give in something and say we'll have to find the answer within this so to do that i mean you know rib a plan of work or all the design methods most of them are linear and we might have to get integrated design approaches into our teaching as well and that is a good research area for us to uh, explore and all will change with this which will give good results in that uh, then uh, third point fourth point i want to uh, get with the institutional levels like slie ipsl uh, iesl uh, all these institute uh, institute should get together and drive themselves for one goal which is not happening in our country because they are they are having isolated say i think this is our education system which has isolated us uh, from the beginning from different 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 uh, points that we have been put in but when it comes to sustainability and energy there's no isolation it's one question that we all have to answer. so i think that is uh, fourth point uh, fifth point uh, then uh, say how much as a developing country we are going to contribute to this uh, global crisis is something that we should look at very very carefully uh because sometimes you might see that you might take undertake research to see say how much of energy that we are using in our buildings comparatively to uh say the developed countries now if you take the resource consumption by the developed country it is proportional to our countries so in that sense how much of uh costs that we should incur to balance this global uh, thinking uh, is something to be seriously looked at and seriously uh, discussed at international forum so that uh, we will get certain benefits i suppose uh, in those terms so these are the five these are the five points that i would like to uh, stop at that because i have taken my five minutes thank you okay uh, thank you mr navratna and uh, i think there was a detailed uh, outlining of perhaps the over in terms of uh, i guess you know the word there is collaboration um, and collaboration at different levels and uh, along those lines uh, mr narath i would uh, i would ask your question um, you are a long time uh, contributor to slie and slie is the, i guess the in authority um, uh, 
evaluate the 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 what what you in a, in a professional organization like SL, SLIA in uh, identifying and supporting industry and university collaboration do, do you see a role there or are, are, are you are you involved in, in i think yes. yeah i think uh, i that's that's exactly the fourth point that i brought up uh, because uh, i don't think uh, say yes there is uh, say of course uh, uh, all the institutes in sri lanka uh, have uh, contributed towards the policy matters but however i don't think it is adequate i don't think uh, from uh, say say of course uh, supporting research and supporting um, other things uh, and the policy development uh, one thing their contribution is less and number two uh, i would say that the opportunity to contribution was also less so that is something that i think we'll have to look at seriously uh, of course because they they how much they can contribute to uh, contribute to is is a question depending on how much they get involved in the context thanks um, I, i will uh, ask a similar question from dr vijaytonga as well uh, dr vijaytonga can you sort of reflect on the i guess the role of policy making institutions like adb can help in you know supporting this kind of collaboration so, i mean how do you as the chief of energy group identify and support interactions between any any reflection on that yeah um can you hear me am yes. i breaking yeah okay yes um uh, that's that's very important actually uh, you know as a financing institution um it's not easy uh, to directly uh, deal with academia as you know uh because we are there uh, to lend uh, money uh, to uh, you know for specific investment projects but along with it we always bring in uh, uh, technical assistance uh, like you know as i said for instance this study which we do uh, you know how to accommodate renewable intermittent renewable energy in the power system that's a study and that's where the academia can come in so obviously uh, as an institution we we may enter into contracts with consultants but uh, uh, you know we can do the same thing or we can get uh, academia involved in these studies and that can uh, you know uh, happen through through the utility for instance if you have zero electricity board uh, looking at this problem and the solutions to it zero uh, you know uh, you know zero moroto for instance can work with uh, the ceb who will be financed our technical assistance can come uh, to zero electricity board to make uh, you know to get that study done and you know zero moroto can be part and parcel of that uh, so uh, likewise uh, in, not directly indirectly we can do that but on top of that I'll, i i must tell you we at the moment have a, have a very important project in moroto university a microgrid project right we are setting up a microgrid at a cost of about 1.5 million dollars actually that's a grant money coming from adb so we do that kind of thing that is a pilot project and that can happen and and that my pilot project will definitely uh, lead to a lot of research work in in intermittent uh, sources and how to integrate them how to how to expand microgrids and what problems are there and all that it's it's a, it's a it's an area of research by itself and that uh, is catalyzed through this investment so there are ways and means of doing it and and, and we continue to do that yeah. right uh, but uh, one of the problems though is that you know generally universities and industry often have you know different motivations for collaborating um, so uh, you know how, how do we identify sort of a common areas before co-working and collaborating i i guess i guess that is that is important isn't it um, yeah exactly this is exactly what is uh, what what i think we have to do in the sense we cannot come up with research work or, or studies just for the sake of doing it and you cannot be in a silo and 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 uh, imagine a project uh, imagine a problem in your university room and then try to solve it and ask the industry to help no that's not going to work now the example which i gave you exactly the kind of thing which the university should be doing it should be practical it should be uh, something which is needed in the industry it may not be immediately it may be in one or two years or three years time then the, the industries which are looking at the future can support such thing but others will have to be what is happening now 
as I said, if the CEB has a problem with absorbing intermittent renewable energy, they have to solve that issue. And to solve that issue, we should help from the academia. Not, not something which will happen in uh, you know, 25 years time. That, of course, kind of research also will have to happen, but that's a se separate kettle of fish. Immediately, what we have to do is look at the problems in the industry and try to address them, right? And that's the kind of research I think the universities will have to uh, work on. That can be very, uh, uh, you know, specific, country-specific uh, uh, issues. That's, those are the ones which we need to first look at, not, not the other ones, uh, you know, uh, immediately. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijay. That was very, very informative. Um, oh, I, I think we have like another about five to eight minutes. So I, I, I'm going back to uh, Dr. Karnaratna, again, the same lines. Um, you know, as the president of CIOB, uh, what do you expect from the university um, in terms of contributing uh, to your industry um, from a from an intellectual point of view, from a uh, from a from a research point of view. Yeah, Melinda, it's it's, it's very important thing we, what we should do. Uh, we are working with the University of Moratua on uh, international research has been done and educating our contractors on the international research projects. But the thing is, we have so many things we have to do it in our country. Now take take, take example like sand. We have various quality of sand. Some consultants are not allowing dune sand. Some consultants are not allowing sea sand. So we should have uh, uh, R&D division where you have done uh, do some researchers and prove, okay, the sea sand is going to uh, uh, keep for these days. Either we can do it or, or, or you should reject it. So do these kind of things are not happening in Nata. So, so many researchers has to be done. So we have to get together the universities and the industry people to do these re researchers. I think government should uh, come in between to do this because the industry is not interested to spend their own money. Then the university also can't afford. So the government should come in between. And we have requested the government so many times, please uh, start universities of Sri Lanka. I hope we have to press it more and more in years to come uh, to make this uh, make this happen otherwise the industry will be in trouble and the prices will go up and you know uh, so we can do a lot more if if the academy and the industry get together and develop the r&d division maybe all right okay thank you um uh, mr navaratna um, I, I just one question but perhaps that's slightly much more philosophical um you know especially in a in a in a, in, a, in a discipline like urban design, I mean, you, you of course have tangible, uh, you know, pragmatic issues that you need to tackle, you know, like lack of urban spaces, you know, polarization of space and labor in the cities, poor state of social infrastructure like transportation and so on. Um, even the, 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 the building culture, the dime building culture that is in the city. I mean, if you look at places like, I don't know, Kagal, uh, you know, uh, Abisavel, uh, any small town, you know, we have these sort of ribbons, which are, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 constrained by, you know, a, a plethora of substandard building materials. Um, but at the same time, you know, a, a, a discipline like sub, uh, urban design is, you know, it's, it's also deeply academic, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, it, it requires a multi-philosophical approach, um, you know, where you need to recognize theories and intellectual positions, I would say, you know, spanning from pragmatic political discourses to utopian ideologies, scientific approaches, you know, historical typologies, even, you know, cognitive research, you know, just to merely understand how people behave in spaces. Um, so do you think that this lack of cohesive institutional and intellectual, again, it goes back to your collaborative design approach. Is it, what is at fault? I mean, is it, is it the problem of, you know, the, uh, the urban development in our part of the world that uh, seemingly, you know, we are, uh, we are we are managing urban development by regulations, but not necessarily by creating uh, uh, adequate policies. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I think uh, urban development uh, is uh, is uh, not a process uh, for a country 
uh, of our culture, of our country or culture, uh, just can borrow like that because, because it is not the done research, say what, uh, say uh, intellectuals or philosophical or what walkability or giant gales or somebody else's theories or um, just cannot be brought into another culture and just planted. Because that has to be modified. That has to be uh, looked at from point of view of affordability of us because our that is exactly what I was saying because say, say nightlife in cities, for example, uh, we all talk and I, I as a teacher also go and say that where is nightlife in your city? What is the nightlife that you have given into this particular location? Uh, look at Singapore, look at Bangkok or something like that. But say somebody has to turn back and ask the question, are we of a culture where the nightlife is so much promoted like in other countries? Or is it only needed where the tourism is working? So I'm just taking a pragmatic example to answer your philosophical question. If, if yes, then how? And how do you do that without having a cultural conflict? And, and that is a special answer at the end of the day. So that special answer should come in a collective effort than a singular designer effort. Urban designer which should be supported by, as you rightly said, a, a good sociologist, good economist, good financial planner, good energy planner, etc., etc. So what, uh, what I'm, I'm saying and promoting uh, here is that we say, say we do not do this integrated design policy even, even at urban, say, urban design contexts, uh, even in other countries where it has to be done that way, uh, we are not doing it because we are, say, sometimes uh, political motivations or certain other things are, dry, are becoming driving forces of these design uh, processes. So in that, then your, uh, say, multiple rule, uh, say, sidelines and one person or one designer comes in front so that those are the those are the issues of course depending on say for example if it is a infrastructure project in the urban context then of course the infrastructure engineer has to lead the grounds but then how much effect that infrastructure project has the uh, to the society to the culture to everything must be brought as as a as a complex uh, integrated answer so so that's what i'm saying all right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Navratna. So I, I think we have almost hit four o'clock. Um, so uh, I will I will just quickly in one minute summarize perhaps the discussion that we had. Um, I, I think there are a few takeaways, I guess. Um, um, first, I think it, you know, the, the role of the professional and, you know, policymaking institutions can play, I guess, in supporting Academic industry collaboration is important, you know, especially to identify different interactions and relationships that are possible between universities and industries. Um, but at the same time, I think that as universities, we also have to work towards, I guess, strengthening how we disseminate our work, um, how we share our research, um, and uh, I guess even develop policies to encourage collaboration with industrial actors. Um, and uh, and in that in the, in the process, I, I, I think what is also critical, uh, I guess, is to sort of identify the the motivations for collaborating. I guess you know to find uh, the, the the common areas. Um, I hope that you know the discussion today has been quite fruitful. I think we were able to identify few critical research areas. Uh, perhaps we could uh, build up from here onward in terms of. The energy sector in terms of uh, cities and urban development and, and, and also in terms of uh, the construction sector. So uh, so with that note, I'll, I'll conclude the session. Um, I will co certainly come back to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, you know uh, 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 becoming uh, a part of the panel being to do this in such short notice. Um, and uh, I also thank you all for listening to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Great right. day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Patiraja, as well as the panelists.
for that very thought provoking uh, discussion um, it was indeed very interesting uh, because many thought provoking ideas came out of it uh, particularly the idea about not working in silos i mean uh, this is indeed something for us to think about as researchers uh, for instance the idea of sustainable cities definitely uh, uh, makes a lot of sense and it, it is linked to the 2030 uh, un agenda etc but how uh, it was brought together not working in uh, it's not just the job of a urban designer or uh, or an engineer it, it is a job of different uh, uh, people with different expertise um, if such a Uh, as well as uh, economies, etc. So that was a very interesting conversation, indeed. Um, now I would like to uh, go on to a uh, few messages from our sponsors, and then I will come back uh, to introduce the next uh, moderator and go on to our next panel discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we move on to our third panel discussion. Uh, this discussion will be in the area of digital economy. The theme of the discussion is research and development for a, uh, research and development for the digital economy. Uh, this session will be moderated by Dr. Subha Fernando, uh, who is a senior lecturer from the Faculty of Information Technology. Uh, I hand over to Dr. Subha Fernando. Over to you, Dr. Subha. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are waiting for one of the panelists.
Okay, very good evening and sorry for the delay. Warm welcome to everyone. I'm Subha Fernandu and the uh, moderator of this panel, R&D for Digital Economy. Well, I have prepared kind of few questions that allows me to roll out this session. If anyone would want to interject any questions, you are more than welcome. So before getting kicked off, I would like to request my distinguished panelists to introduce themselves, who are you, who you are representing, and your expertise is up. Rasadami, can we start from you? But, uh, thank you, Subha, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm honored to be in this panel, especially such distinguished uh, panelists, such as Professor uh, Gyan Dias and uh, Madhur um, I'm uh, Tamin Dalahakon, I'm a professor uh, uh, at the Latrobe University, uh, Australia. Uh, that's in uh, Latrobe University is based in Melbourne. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, the director of a research center called Data Analytics and Cognition. So cognition is artificial intelligence, but brain inspired uh, version of artificial intelligence. And my expertise, my research um, uh, is based, um, is uh, focused on developing uh, and advancing artificial intelligence um, and also transforming the advancement uh, and translating these to technology and technology platforms that can be utilized in industries and various other applications. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Madhur Ratnayaka. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Madhur Ratnayaka. It's delighted to be here. Uh, with Tamin and Professor Gamage uh, and Subha. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I represent the IT industry in the country. I also work for Vitusa um, and represent uh, the industry in a few organizations. Yeah. So great to be here. Thank you. Press again. Uh, thank you, Subha. Uh, I'm Gihan Das. I'm a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the uh, University of Moratua. Uh, in addition to that, I think uh, I've been running something which could be considered a digital service 
long before the word digital had the current meaning, of course, there was a word called digital, which uh, is a different table uh, well, related meaning. Uh, that is the uh, domain registry where we register domain names. And also I am a vice president of FITIS, the Federation of Information uh, Technology Services uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, so which there are two, we have a digital services chapter, which is trying to develop the digital services sector in Sri Lanka. So I will represent all of these today. Thank you. So with that, let me set the layout for today's discussion. So and from my perspective, uh, the digital economy is characterized by digitizing the many products and services with the help of internet and many other supportive activities. This digitization drives massive economic transformations, disrupting all the small to medium and enterprise level industries. This dynamic change calls us for understanding all these key drivers and detecting trends and the policy changes. From your perspective, how do you see this digital economy and where it is heading at? I would like to give it as an open question for all the three panel members. Professor Gihan or Professor Daminda Kans? Yeah, I would like to uh, start. Uh, oh, okay, so shall we then uh, start? Let me very briefly give a couple of slides, uh, not a whole lot, just one or two slides. Uh, right, let me share that. Uh, right, hopefully, oops. Uh, just hold on, it's uh, waiting for me. Right. Uh, okay, so let's share that. Uh, and uh, so what are uh, digital goods and, uh, sorry, let me go back to the top. Uh, right. Uh, so let me try to identify what we mean by digital goods and services. So first one is digital good. This is a product which is digital in form. So digital means it's composed of bits. And a very good example is a song which you have on your phone. And uh, there is no CD, there is no record, there is no other physical thing. The song is on your phone as a set of bits. That's a digital good which people can sell you or you can buy or you can do whatever, rent or whatever. Then digital services are services which are provided by moving services from one place, a bit from one place to the other. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is, let's say somebody says, okay, uh, can you send me thousand rupees to do whatever, right? And what I do is I log into my online banking or open my banking app and send that person thousand rupees. Does anything physical go from me to him? No. Does anything physical go from my bank to his bank? No. All that moves is some bits, but actually the money has gone. Then I can think of even a simpler example. I send an email to a friend asking me to help me with a task. What have I done? I have communicated some uh, information to another person and that person based on that information does something. And that can be considered part of a digital service. And let's take another example, which I think we have been all very familiar with the last few months. I use an app to order food to my house. So what turns up? physical food, which you can eat. Very, very physical, right? You don't want to have digital food delivered to your house. The delivery man, the term, guy who turns up in the yellow or the green jacket is also physical. And what is digital there? I mean, a physical person comes and delivers physical food. What's digital is the restaurant gets an order for food. The driver is told to collect it and then deliver it and both get paid based on my clicking on things on my phone. So there is no physical thing which goes from my phone to the restaurant, nothing which goes from the restaurant to the driver and the driver to me, except the actual uh, food, which of course gets delivered. So these are what I mean by digital goods and services, and they provide speed, convenience, and accuracy. Okay, 
Would you like to add more on that? Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Jan. Just uh, uh, to further um, uh, um, uh, discuss a little bit more on that. So uh, I would say the uh, when you say digital economy, is an economy based on digital technologies in a much more broader, if I take a step uh, sort of uh, back. Uh, and it has been called the internet economy, web economy. So obviously the internet or the web uh, play has played a major role, a key role in uh, creating this, uh, this environment uh, uh, in the digital economy. So the best examples, uh, I mean, to, to understand, uh, we can look at the digital platforms, uh, although we can, uh, such, such as Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, it's a, a way of life as well. So there is a number of things. So there's a social aspects involved as well. The adoption, not just the adoption, but acceptance of uh, digi digital things, digitalization, if, you, if there is such a word, and if you call it that, uh, so what happens, like these companies such as these, they connect the, the market, the participants together. And in a virtual world, it's this virtual world, which we as human beings all over the world, all around the world, are getting or accepting, I think, much more comfortable in uh, living in. I would say that is uh, how, uh, one way of stepping back uh, 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 from uh, uh, understanding uh, like a helicopter view. Uh, so, for example, the optimal prices uh, uh, the, and the trust or the, the negotiations between strangers, that happens via digital communication and using these platforms, obviously, uh, where the internet provides uh, the, 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 found the base. I would say that's uh, digital economy. Thank you. Mr. Madhu, as the CEO of the, one of the biggest IT companies, what is your perspective? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think the, the two professors shared what is it, and, and, and I'd like to spend a more, bit of time probably talking where it's going, right, in terms of, you know, where do we see the future, at least in the, uh, in the next maybe five, ten years, right? I think if you really look at uh, what has been happening over the last maybe 20, 30 years, um, we've seen tremendous growth, right? It, it's, a, uh, it's what's called an exponential curve. You know, your exponential curve comes like this and then uh, turn into, you know, go to the, the, the exponential uh, power. Right? So I think we are really at that turning point of uh, this whole digital economy or digitalization, whatever we call it, all the technology driven transformation that's going on. And uh, I, I think it's a, uh, that turning point is what's making it very, very interesting right now, right? If you think about the rate of change, uh, that's happening. A great example is if you just look at uh, Moore's law, right? Moore's law has been, you know, every 24 to 18 months, uh, number of transistors you can put on a, a chip doubles, right? For the last 30 plus years, this was working like clockwork, right? Without fail, Moore's law has been uh, uh, working, right? So what that does is it creates, uh, you know, if you keep doubling every, every, you know, so every say 18 months, at certain point, the doubling accelerated a rate at an exponent rate, right? It, it is, uh, and to give you an example, um, there's a great story about uh, just to illustrate the rate of growth, right? And um, there was this the guy who invented the uh, chess game, the 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 uh, Indian uh, um, inventor. He he took this game to the uh, emperor and said, "Hey, you know, look at this uh, beautiful game that we have invented." And emperor was highly impressed and said. Uh, it's a great invention. Uh, you let me know whatever you want. I, I'll uh, I'll grant you whatever your wish is. So the inventor said, "I'm a I'm a humble person. I don't need need a lot. Just give me some rice to feed my family." And just to illustrate the point, how much rice you want, I need. Just give me one grain of rice in the first. If you look at the chessboard, eight by eight, sixty-four squares. Said so put one grain of rice on the first square. And when you go to the second square, just double it, you put me two. If you go to the third one, just give me four grains of rice and fourth one, eight and 80 uh, and so forth, right? So, so King said, that's great. You know, that's not a big ask and uh, they went away. And, uh, you know, weeks went by and nothing had happened. So King's asking what's going on. Why are you not given this uh, great inventor his price? He was asking for a simple uh, bunch of rice. Then his uh, 
his uh, men came and uh, tell the emperor, uh, if you just doubling, keep doubling the, the rice on the chessboard to be able to give what he's asking to cover the whole chessboard, it will require a rice pile as big as the Mount Everest, right? And we don't have the entire, uh, entire kingdom ha doesn't have that amount of rice. And obviously, King was very angry, uh, 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 brought him in and behead the inventor uh, immediately for tricking him. Now, the moral, <laughs> that's not the moral of the story, but just to explain, up until the half the chessboard, right? You know, in the first half of the chessboard, adding to doubling, it, 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 it's not a big deal, right? When you come to the, maybe at the half of the chessboard, it's about, uh, you know, maybe one field of rice. But after the half, it becomes exponential, right? You know, you know you're really adding big, large numbers doubling. So I think we are really at that point, right? That's why when you really, uh, in the growth of this digital economy, if you look at what we think as science fiction, maybe five years ago, right? You know, things like going to space, autonomous cars, drones, you know, the AI, what AI could do, all that stuff. Five years ago, seven, eight years ago, we would think it's science fiction, right? Today, it's happening at a, you know, science fiction has become real. And and not only that, it's, it's becoming real on a, more of a platform, right? Everybody's building on top of what others have, right? So if you look at AI, uh, you know, you're using the algorithms, you're using the mechanics that people have done, right? So, so that's how it's, this whole exponential curve is working, right? So it's very difficult for us to comprehend that rate of change after the second half of chessboard, right? So we are really at that point uh, of turning the curve. So you will see some tremendous growth when you, you know, based on this whole advancement of technology, you know, quantum, quantum computers and things like that, that comes in in the next, you know, our lifetime, you will see this whole space dramatically change. So if you ask uh, where, the, where the future is, where it's heading, I think we haven't seen anything yet. Right? It's just the tip of the iceberg. And we see, if you see the second half of chessboard, which is going to be very, very exciting. Competing. Wouldn't it be a, one of the key drivers that will damage the dis, uh, that will further exponentially grow these disruptions to the IT industry? So I didn't catch the first part. So can you repeat that? The quantum computing. Yeah. Would be the main disruptive technology for the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be one of the main disruptive technologies for sure. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to say. Uh, you know, predicting future in this space is. You know, yeah, almost near impossible, right? And, and, and you know, you never know. Two guys in a garage might be working on something that uh, none of us haven't even dreamt of, and will be out uh, tomorrow. That change the completely change the paradigms that we've been working. Right. So, so that's the nature of this space. Thank you. So, Professor Damin, as Mr. Madhurat Naik well stated, that this disruption is very massive and unpredictable. If somebody wants to survive in this disruption, in this digital transformation, what kind of disruptive techniques and the key drivers that person as an enterprise should listen to? Uh, it's a, I would say, uh, it's a, people say as a person, as a person, if you take an individual, I think you'll have to uh, go with the with the tide uh, because uh, I don't think as an individual unless it's those two people uh, uh, Madhu mentioned <laughs> in the garage <laughs> who will uh, create the tide you know that that we will all sort of be uh, dragged along with. But uh, the, if you look at the so what are the key uh, drivers? Um, uh, I mean uh, of course and definitely um, the, the technology the technological advancements that has been happening for a number of decades, but as Madhu said, we have reached that midpoint now. And that's where the, the, the curve sort of really starts going exponential. So we are at that stage. So uh, look, uh, exciting times, uh, times of change is always exciting. So hopefully we'll have a good, uh, good, good ride. Uh, so things, obviously the internet, which has been around for a while, but look at what the internet is giving us or making us do or may give you the possibilities that come up now. So again, to Madhu's point of where in the middle, and of course the, the cloud and so on. And quantum computing is one, but there is uh, other things which uh, uh, something called neuromorphic computing, perhaps some of you. So it's brain-like computing. So there's neuromorphic chips, brain-like uh, computer chips that are currently, uh, there's an IBM version, there's an Intel version, uh, which uh, mostly at research level, 
but you know what happens it's uh, very quickly now will will come out and that will uh, we, we still don't know I, i'm lucky enough to have um, a, a research pro- project going with the intel uh, chip called loihi and uh, amazing even sometimes i feel i don't know whether i can call it scared but uh, so excited so because i don't know what's going to come out of that so technological advancement is a really really you know, the, the thing that that drives this but also the adoption so as i mentioned before as well we uh, and uh, even the younger generation much more uh, they just you know somehow uh, take this on it, it's uh, like they 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 say uh, fish to water it's uh, now, now if, for example my children although i'm i'm supposed to be a computer scientist you know been dealing in playing with computers for for decades but my son sort of uh, can sort of grasp things much much faster so how does that happen i don't know but and this is i mean the, the, and we know that we socialize and so on so from uh, uh, the, of course the amazon to airbnb to uber and so on uh, the, which we don't even think uh, but just use it we are so comfortable with these but then health care health health care uh, social media amazing what do you do social media is not just socialization use for from politics to and so on and then of course the we are seeing the negative the the, the side of that uh, misinformation and it's a, it's a huge problem uh, the, the not just the fake news but uh, uh, there's the uh, where we can change uh, the person's image the videos and so on and make uh, the others believe that there is a uh, you know this person is saying these things or you know acting in a, in a strange way and so on so uh, our trust of systems politicians leaders Uh, 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 become eroded and lost. So, so there can be the negative side. There can be huge uh, sort of uh, uh, negative impacts that can be made in society without, uh, you know, with atomic bombs and so on. So there's a, so technological advancement, adoption of the technology by human beings, and of course, when we adopt, what happens is that data is created. So digital representation of everything that we do become available. so there's a digital version from uh, our uh, not not only our behaviors and uh, op- what opinions even emotions are captured so we do uh, in my research lab a lot of work on capturing emotions from of course social media because in social media we are we sort of uh, uh, are much more open than a homo formal sort of way of communication because of that there's a lot more about us that we reveal to a digital uh, uh, forum which can with the right technology uh, be be derived or um, uh, tra- transformed and modeled so uh, then because almost everything about us and our behaviors to our emotions and opinions are digitally available artificial intelligence i would say is the next of course i'm biased but ai is making a huge uh, impact here because of all this but then all these are interconnected artificial intelligence requires the technological advancements requires that humans are using these and have adopted these uh, and uh, because of that about everything about us is available in digital form and ai comes in and uh, so uh, to, to uh, be able, so what, what is ai really perhaps it's a type of you can think of it as a type of automation so that machines can uh, do things much more independently by themselves much more without a less and less human intervention so i would say these are the main drivers of this economy so of course there's a bad just like everything else there's the lots of benefit lots of good things but then there's the other side as well thank you professor amin mr madhu as the business professional i have a question for you now this uh, quantum computing artificial intelligence digital transformation and adaptations and the exponential growth of this uh, digital disruption so what strategies these small and medium companies should looking into if they want to survive in this transformation yeah no great question you know i, I think it's this whole uh, enterprise as large companies and small and medium uh, definition itself i think we should really look at it right revisit 
uh, you know, small doesn't mean that you are less capable, right? It, it's really, I, I would say it's, if you are trying to bucket companies, right. you will have, uh, you know, uh, uh, legacy companies and a ne next generation companies, right? I think the legacy companies will obviously, whether it's a small or medium or enterprise level, they'll have a tough time if they don't transition. But then the next generation companies who are born digital and, and really understand this whole digital uh, 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 changes very well will transition in. So it doesn't really matter whether you have a two person or you know 2000 person company. What matters is, do you have the right DNA, the right approach, right leadership, track right talent to be able to really take advantage of what's going on. And quite honestly, the, the, the no longer size doesn't matter. It's about how fast you can move, how well you can track talent uh, to do some of those transformation ahead of us. So I think speed is a lot more important in the exponential curve than anything else, right? And in fact, size must be a disadvantage uh, than an advantage. So the uh, so when it comes to this, this whether they are size, they could be small or large, but the uh, the fool that can invest on this. Uh, yeah, disruptions, how much energy they can put on this to survive these disruptions, what is most important. And that is that is taking the leadership and correct decisions. So if I suggest one of these uh, strategies could be looking into the research and innovations because you don't have any clue of what is going to be happen. But obviously, if you take a particular business segments, there might be use cases where it is emerging these days. So that will be a good point for these, uh, these enterprises to looking for the research and development and innovations. So what kind of research and innovations they should looking into? If you can take these uh, by taking some examples from different business segments like the health industry and the finance industry and even the IT industry. Okay, so yeah, that, that's a great point. And I, I, I would take this prop probably more broadly if you don't mind. And, and I, there was a great book I read called Ma uh, Machine, Platform and Crowd. The two professors from MIT, Andrew McAfee and uh, Eric, Eric uh, Brian Offerson, I think it's the two gentlemen who wrote the book. And they talk about uh, three uh, rebalances right, that's happening. And, and I'll, I'll explain the three. And that really kind of outlines what companies need to do and how companies you know, take advantage of the digital Transformation. Firstly, uh, uh, mind and machine rebalance. Right? That's number one. Number two is product to platform rebalance. The third one is called the core to crowd. Right? And if I explain the three, first one is about you know if you take mind and machine, and really it's about it's about not saying mind is better than machine or vice versa. It's about you know what what work that you give it to machine, what work that you give it to mind. Right? Because in in certain areas, machines are now surpass human ability to solve some of the problems. You know, I think we have two professors who can talk for this very well. If you take AI, things like vision, right? It's completely surpass human ability to do that. And even uh, uh, many areas of language recognition, there are so many areas that uh, the, the machine certainly surpass human ability in that specific thing. You know, I'm not talking about the general intelligence, but there are very specific areas that machines surpass, right? So, so in a uh, on a next generation company, you have to figure out what is the balance. What is the work that you want humans to do? What is the work that you want to get the machines to do? Right? That that that's one drive. Second one is the the, the product to platform shift, right? You know, uh, you know, maybe the if you look at traditional companies, will build a product and then try to sell that product, and you have companies like Airbnb. Uh, you know, Ubers of this world, which are called the platform companies, right? How do you really uh, uh, drive economies of scale, drive new way of business by way of platform, right? So in your business, what part of business can be turned into a platform, right? In, uh, so that's the kind of second big driver, you know, thinking about your business, not only from a product perspective and what, and a platform perspective, right? So every business can be thought of as a platform business, right? And you have to really think about how to drive that, right? Think about education, right? In the universities, you know, the platform version of that is companies like Udemy and who are bringing the supplier and the student and they enable through a platform, right? And they are in, their, in education, but not, don't have professors, right? 
uh, you know, they have everybody crowd. So, so that, that's kind of the platform model. And, and I think you have to really think about where in your business you can apply platform. The third one is core crowd, right? Core is, core is having your full time, your core, uh, core, core teams that you have in the company. Crowd is obviously how do you crowdsource things, right? You know, you've seen in many instances that the crowd is a lot more intelligent than the best expert that you can get uh, in your company, right? So, so that's the other shift. How, at what point or at what processes, what areas of your business is better crowdsourced than trying to look for uh, look for individual uh, uh, individual experts, right? So that's a third rebalance. You know, looking at how do you uh, bring uh, you know balance between core to crowd. So these are the ways that businesses have to think about if you're transitioning into a, a digital uh, first company or getting you to take advantage of the digital patterns. Uh, I thought that was very well explained by these two MIT professors. You know, I love that uh, uh, definition, mind to machine, platform, product to platform and crowd to core to crowd and finding that right balance and redefining your business as a next generation business. Right? I think that's the kind of task ahead for a lot of the leadership teams to really take advantage of the, the, the exponential growth that we see in front of us. Thank you very much. It's really good insights, Peter. So, Professor Gihan Das, so are you with us? Oh, yes, go ahead, yes. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Now, as Mr. Madhu said that, whether it is the machines or the humans, or whether it's the product or the platform or the core or the crowd, we know that research is not that easy. That is, the it takes a lot of cost and it is really costly. From academic point of view, as the senior professor and also the vice president of FITIS, what strategies you suggest for these companies if they want to decide whether it is the machines or humans, whether they should uh, product or platform, basically? Right. So I think uh, my view is uh, there is a lot of research uh, which is needed. But uh, for small and medium companies, uh, you know, they cannot do it on their own. So one of the things we need to identify is, okay, as Sri Lanka, as a country, what do we need for our companies? Of course, we can also look at other countries because what we need for our companies is likely to be quite similar to what other countries uh, have implemented for their companies. Uh, and how can we make this available to our companies. And when I say companies, it not, needn't even be a company. It can be even a very small person. For example, let's say I need a plumber. Maybe I have a tap which is leaking in my house and I want a plumber to come and fix it. Now, if I'm an average person, I really might not know a reliable plumber. And, uh, and I will maybe ask my friends and they will recommend somebody, but that person may be far away and then it might not work. And he might say, I'm busy and I can't come today. So I have a requirement to get my step fixed. Then the plumbers want customers and they are sitting and trying to figure out, okay, how do I do that? I mean, they obviously they cannot run a big marketing campaign on TV, Facebook and everything. Say I'm a plumber and, you know, come and get me. So what we need are uh, innovations like startups or even big companies, doesn't matter, who will provide these platforms in Sri Lanka and connect people. So I mean, Amadu mentioned about Airbnb. Uh, it's been extremely successful in connecting people who have rooms for let. They not, need not be big hotels. And people who want to go somewhere maybe don't want to spend the same amount that a big hotel would uh, charge. And uh, then if you take Pick Me, it connects people who want to travel from here to there and uh, people who have a vehicle and are willing to take people from here to there. So now those are just two examples which have been very successful travel and then also the, I mean, the actual physical travel as well as uh, accommodation. Now, what else? I think if we just open our minds, there's a lot of possibilities which are available for innovation as well as for R&D because R&D doesn't necessarily mean you're going to come up with something fancy, some new mathematical algorithm or something like that. That's not necessarily true. It's often using, I mean, AI, which uh, Daminda is, uh, 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 is an expert on, uh, will, is already has 
plenty of stuff we can use. I don't think we really need to come up with completely new techniques. We need to use the techniques we have to intelligently connect people who want a service and people who, uh, uh, who, who can provide the service. So I think that's what we should do. We should figure out what is their need and then try to uh, fulfill that need. So as a senior professor from the academia, what do you think the education sector can help with this uh, journey with the small and medium enterprises? Right. I think one of the major things we can do is create a lot of awareness. Today, the average small uh, industry in the small business and even large businesses, there are plenty of large businesses which have thousands of employees, uh, turnover in the billions and so on, who are happy to do what they did 20 or 30 years ago. Maybe they have some small accounting system, inventory control system, and they're very happy with that. If you ask, do you have any digital things? Are you looking for your customers digitally? They will be very surprised and wonder what the hell we are talking about. So we need to create the awareness uh, among SMEs, larger companies, whoever, what this digital economy can do. And we have good success stories. We have good success stories, both locally and internationally, but show other people that they can use the same uh, technologies to um, uh, improve their business and also for consumers. Most people in Sri Lanka are very scared to pay online, especially they hate putting credit card numbers online. They feel that somebody will steal it. And one problem there is we don't have legislation in other countries. For example, USA, there is a maximum of $50 that you can lose if you are uh, encounter some kind of online fraud. The bank will have to bear the rest. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there's nothing like that. And then what will happen is if you put a credit card number somewhere and something goes wrong, you might be liable to pay for the entire thing. So we need legal safeguards. We need procedural safeguards to safeguard people. And also uh, we need to convince people. We need to convince people that their money is safe and it won't suddenly disappear. Okay, thank you, sir. So, the Professor Daming and Mr. Madhu, there was a uh, discussions between the industry needs in terms of innovation and strategies, and also we know it is really costly, and also we need to bring this awareness of using the existing technologies and intelligent programs, for an example, so they can further smooth and efficient their already existing systems. However, when it comes to the education sector, especially the higher education sector, there are a lot of academic research being going on, but it is very uh, unlikely many of these academic research have a significant role in these innovation uh, strategies or the, their research strategies in these uh, industry sectors. Would you mind of elaborating what could be such reason for us so that everybody can understand where is the problem? Thanks, um, uh, Madhu. Uh, how about uh, uh, let's see uh, how we can go, <laughs> go about it. Uh, how if I sort of uh, because I'm not uh, uh, I know what's happening in the academia and that the government has uh, recognized the, need, uh, the the importance of these and uh, uh, what changes that um, the, uh, it's happening in academia to encourage such things and if uh, I guess uh, I can. Uh, then uh, Madhu can say that uh, as a as a um, uh, leader in the industry leader, in the, especially in a technology company, whether this kind of approaches can be of value or will be of value even to uh, Sri, the, the Sri Lankan industries. For example, uh, something uh, that's happening is that to encourage um, academics to start thinking about industry uh, research. Um, uh, has uh, Madhu dropped off? Or? Yeah, he has, but... Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so, um, so, for example, in Australia, there are different types of um, uh, research grant uh, programs, so program, uh, initiatives. So academic, uh, especially a senior academic, is supposed to find uh, opportunities, apply for grants, and bring in grant, um, money, funding in, in, into the university. So there was these different categories of grants. The, the most, most prestigious is the 
uh, Australian Research Council or National Health and Medical Research Council type of grants, which are called category one, two uh, different types. And the industry uh, money, if you go out to industry, convince a company to uh, give you money to do research, that's called category four. In the past, it wasn't as not just the prestige, but you didn't get so many points uh, if you bring in industry money compared to these prestigious grants. But it, that has been scrapped. Now, it's the dollar value that matters. The, the industry money is uh, considered counted as equal uh, in terms of the credit that you get, the, 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 uh, in terms of importance to, to your academic performance. As the, so that has encouraged, so we can, there are many academics who can go and really say, this is, um, the, I have done this research, it has application value, uh, give us money. And, and that, that is happening. Other thing is the type of program, type of uh, research, um, um, the, um, the, the initiatives and grant schemes. So for the government has industry innovation grants. Madhu, uh, uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, I, I, I'm from Australian side, because I'm not uh, so much familiar with the, the uh, Sri Lanka has some academic initiatives that the government and the universities have set up to encourage industry uh, engagement much more, especially in the digital artificial intelligence analytics uh, uh, the, the type of uh, re research and academic activities. And I guess uh, if you can give your uh, sort of uh, uh, opinion as to whether uh, these initiatives would be of value or will it uh, encourage industry to um, think of collaborating uh, with, uh, with the in the academia as well. So one is, of course, the, uh, the but so there's uh, industry innovation grant. This is more for small um, SMEs, um, small and medium uh, companies, where if the industry puts in, uh, say, uh, half, so for it's a hundred thousand dollars is generally the maximum. It's a small grant scheme, but industry puts in cash fifty thousand. The government provides uh, balance fifty thousand for. Uh, but there has to be an academic partner. It has to be working with an academic partner where the, um, the researchers, the academics uh, uh, develop a, a solution. It could be a product or service or process for industry. So the, and they, even after the 50,000 that the industry gets, there is a, um, the, 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 they get tax uh, benefits as well. So there is one. And there are industry PhD schemes where the industry can sponsor PhD scholarships where the problem comes directly from industry and uh, the, the researchers, the professors, the academics, as well as um, the, the technology, the high performance computing and so on from the university can be utilized by uh, the, the, for, again, solving a business problem. So that PhD student is all like an employee in the company and, uh, for, and paid uh, by, the, and, uh, by, by, by the company. Uh, one more example is that, um, uh, uh, some the way that uh, we have you now there is a lot of demand from industry for in training for for example artificial intelligence and automation and so on where we run these training programs uh, for uh, a number of companies for example optus optus is uh, the, the 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 biggest private telco uh, in australia and we are training their staff reskilling upskilling in artificial intelligence, automation, advanced data analytics uh, um, um, uh, skills. And these are six week short course uh, programs with a certification. So there are a number of initiatives where uh, the government and the universities are pushing for or encouraging. Uh, and they, they, it, it deploys value as well for both parties. Um, uh, I mean, in Sri Lanka, are these things possible or will that be valued to, to industry or interest industry? Right. Can you hear me? I had a bit of a... Yes, uh, you are just... Uh, uh, you are frozen. Other, yeah. yeah, on sideways, but I'm sure. That, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something, yeah. okay, got it. <laughs> when a call comes in, the whole thing freezes on the phone. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think if you really look at the, maybe the, the past few years, uh, this uh, industry research that has been changing, you know, maybe if you go back to five, six years, uh, I didn't think there was a lot going on. There were a few companies, but it's driven by two things. One is the kind of a space that the companies are getting into uh, in a more exploratory space, especially in Sri Lanka, compared to the standard kind of automation kind of work to more now innovative ways. And, and the second is the technologies like 
artificial intelligence and uh, uh, blockchain and so forth also creating a lot more opportunities to create business models and business opportunities and apply technology in very different ways so i think it's from that perspective a lot more companies are uh, are now more geared and more more have the interest in doing that kind of work and research with the universities i mean one in one side i think you know you have to have a level of industry maturity also to be able to engage in research uh, as well right if if you if you're the kind of problem you're solving is not at that level that the the university professors and the research teams are working on then how much collaboration we force nothing will happen oh, so i think the yeah i think that uh, uh, the maturity is coming up and especially driven by things like ai blockchain uh, and, and people are uh, i think a lot more uh, ready for these type of collaborations uh, and opportunities to kind of invest and, and do co invest and things like that i think it will get better uh, for sure it certainly has gotten better in the last 5 years and uh, uh, yeah, sorry let's just quick uh, quick addition to that is that yeah, i fully agree to that uh, it's just that academics very bright brilliant people uh, in more but uh, it's just that uh, they have uh, not spent so much time in uh, especially in the in the, um, uh, the most academics in industry so the way that you look at a problem uh, or a piece of research is different so there is this gap so uh, in my case what uh, i'm lucky enough to have been in industry for then 10 years both it and finance and so on sri lanka and then and, and, uh, in europe as well um, but what i do i've been lucky enough with my sri lankan connections connections with the university of moratua uh, is that uh, i have about 10 phd students who not only have graduated with very high sort of academic uh, sort of Uh, and then they get from moratua but spent in some cases 6 7 years in uh, sri lankan industry so the, for example wso2 um, the 99x and so on there have been tech leads from these companies coming in for their phd's now that makes a huge difference and so the, and you go out and in some cases we put their resumes uh, first of all we send the company and say this is our team and uh, that makes it so uh, we have tech architect in fact i just going to get uh, architect from uh, i can say the tell the company because now he's already signed 99x so 14 years of experience at 99x after his first class honors as more to him now this kind of man coming to do a phd and a research fellowship in uh, the lab that makes a difference so that i can boldly go out and tell an industry okay you what is your problem i i i i can give a good shot at solving this because i have this <laughs> this group of brilliant and experienced people yeah. so that makes yeah. a huge difference yeah i think that's a great point i think having people who had kind of uh, you know experience in both worlds makes a makes a big difference in bridging that uh, industry academia yeah uh, that has to be done yeah. and it's an exciting field and then uh, other thing is that industry is hiring phd's in fact i it be very difficult to keep any, any of these people uh, in 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 the university after their phd's all of my phd students uh, they, they uh, sort of are grabbed yeah, right? so. there's one case uh, even there's this uh, very big casino crown casino uh, in melbourne i mean i won't give the name but uh, perhaps some of you know top uh, brilliant uh, first class honors from moratua phd again top one i managed to convince him to start an academic uh, position uh, with me and within 6 months the guy comes and says i have a very good offer from where crown casino <laughs> so this so, <laughs> meant the casinos hire this kind of people and so that yeah. you be very careful think, about trying to yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i think the, i think especially i'm sure that's around data science and probably that area like, right? yes yes that's right yeah. so i mean the opportunities to do that is huge right and, and and i think especially ai and data science i would say is really ripe for that collaboration because the, there's a lot of awareness in the industry and i think ai has come of age become a lot more yeah. practical yeah. Applica- applied ai is huge so there are maybe verticals like that which are probably had very ripe for a lot more collaboration yeah. and and i think it's happening right and some of these stuff Uh, uh you know when the when the environment is ready when the, the organizer ready it happens they, they won't wait for somebody to come and say hey, yeah. you know go and collaborate right they will be yeah. looking for collaborations 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, what something that I do when I'm talking to industry to, to convince them uh, is that say that uh, we have the luxury of uh, time to actually uh, read the latest research papers and so because the, the, the latest research, for example, vision research, for example, and many others, there is cutting edge research happening and companies like Google and so on, they, they publish in the top conferences. Um, and so uh, in a company, I'm sure, <laughs> Madhu, you know, there's so much time that you can spend on reading uh, that you won't be able to read hundreds of research papers, trying to yeah. grasp these and so on and try trial uh, things, do uh, do trial and error and so on. So that's a value that academia or academics or research labs in the university can provide a company. So working together, so there is value. So if we can convince a company, so there's value in working with these people, yeah. then Absolutely. I, I, I also hope that the whole work from home, remote work paradigm yes. that's you know, accelerated by pandemic will also enable people to do a lot more work, right? I mean, if you look at the whole gig work paradigm, which is happening, you know, more and more people are doing gigs yes. and not necessarily full-time on board in the companies yes. that, that employment model is changing, right? So that lends very well to maybe somebody in a university wants to take two days a week and work in a company yeah. and the three days a week do research. Yes. Yes. That model is, I think, a lot more now, people will be a lot more ready for it, right? In, in the yeah. past, they may not be. Yeah, I think um, uh, that's what I was going to say that. And University of Morotu, obviously, is somewhere, I, what I've seen and the little time that I've spent there, it's a lot easier for University of Morotu Academy because of the prestige of the university. Industry comes to the university. And yeah. line up, I've, uh, I've met so many... Uh, uh, leading, um, uh, especially the tech industry uh, uh, leaders at, at Morotua. While we find it a lot harder, we have to sort of go, you know, chase them up a bit. But uh, so, so the, the, the prestige of the university, uh, it, 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 that, that matters uh, um, a lot and that okay. makes it easier in, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, with that, I would like to raise the next question to the Professor behind us that it's highlighted the fact that in Sri Lanka, the industry is uh, looking collaboration with the University of Morotua, in general with the higher education sector. So, uh, Professor Gihanda, so as the pre senior professor, how do you see that higher education or the academic research can be the fuel to make these innovations and research at a lower cost for these industries? All right, thank you, Shubha. Uh, so I believe that it's not just the education sector, but as uh, Damin also said, we do tend to spend more time uh, looking at the broad perspective, right? Uh, in fact, I believe that's a major thing we do when we train uh, students is not to just, as soon as there's a problem, to come up with a solution instantly based on whatever they know, but to spend a day, two, a week, whatever, trying to understand what is the problem and what other people have done and then come up with a solution. Uh, that's the difference between industry and academia. And some people in the industry sort of laugh at us saying, oh, you give them a problem and they take two weeks to just or two months or two years to just look at it. Uh, but uh, I do believe that the people who know what we really do understand that and know that it is a better product. Right. Now, if you especially look at the small uh, sector, they are not in a position to figure out things themselves. I mean, that means they said uh, even large companies cannot do that, but it's even worse for small companies. They are not in a position to figure out anything for themselves. So I think what we need to do is be proactive, right? We should not wait for a company to come and say, here is a problem, do you have a solution? I think we should go out and look for gaps, look for things which are needs, which are currently not being met, and then figure out, okay, how do we do this? Can we come up with a solution? Can we partner with a startup, partner with a large company, and then we do the research part, and then they may do the development part or whatever it is, and can we come up with a solution to a real problem, which, obviously should make economic sense. We don't want to say, oh, we are um, solving a problem. Uh, and to me, there are some people who say, oh, I have a technology. And I'm looking around for a problem to solve with my technology. So first they have come up with their technology and then they are looking for a problem. 
uh, that is, I would believe, not the correct thing. You have to always look for the problem first and then look around, find the correct technology. And then even the most important thing is not say, here's the technology, but to show people, make it easy for them, develop the software, develop the systems, develop the payment gateways, you know, all those things, the pain points, right? Uh, some of our entrepreneurs will tell them, uh, tell you that sometimes their biggest problem was actually to get their payment gateways properly working, right? And get regulatory approvals and all the things that uh, they needed to do to do whatever they're doing. Uh, and tax would be another issue. Now, uh, for example, PICME is always uh, complaining about unequal tax. Uh, for example, they get tax, whereas their competitor does not because they are not having a presence in Sri Lanka. So we, we need to look at some of those. So those are not necessarily education things, but those are uh, the actual pain points and figure out how people can solve them. And my belief is that as academics, we together with industry should get together and come up with solutions. Not just do some research and publish a paper, which is fine, but we should have a solution which uh, we can develop and industry can help to implement. And then we should go to the customers and say, here we have a solution and this is how we use it. And we also, we need to create a lot of awareness how to do all these things. Okay, thanks again, guys. With that, I think the time allocated for us is over. I would like to thank all my distinguished panelists for their experiences and staying with us in this evening. And thanks for the audience with us also. And that will close up and conclude the session. Thank you very much. The organization committee is over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Subha. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Madhu. Thanks again. And thank you, thank you all. Thank uh you. -huh. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Subha. The digital economy, of course, uh, the modern day, everything has become uh, digitalized, uh, if I can call that. Um, uh, of, of course, we had I mean, a number of interesting uh, points raised by uh, our panelists, uh, how the industry can work with uh, academia to uh, solve uh, certain problems and the key drivers of uh, this digitalization and how this is growing exponentially. Uh, it's all very interesting. I'm, I'm sure the, the attendees found it very enjoyable and engaging. And it's quite exciting when you think about it uh, for the future as well. Um, with that, we come to the end of this particular panel discussion. Now, once again, we go for a, a message from our sponsors. And I will come back with the fourth and final panel discussion for the day. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the last session for the day. Uh, the next session will be themed policy establishment towards sustainable economic growth through research and development. And uh, our moderator for this session will be senior professor Malik Pranasinghe, who is also one of our former vice chancellors. I hand over to uh, Professor Ranasinghe to commence the session and introduce the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, can I start? Can I start? Yeah, uh, okay. Good evening, and welcome to the final session of the Global Research Forum.
Okay. Uh, apologies, Professor. Now you can start. Right. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the final session of the Global Research Forum organized by the Faculty of Graduate Studies at the University of Moratu. As, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Mandrovela Gidara, this session is titled Policy Establishment Towards Sustainable Economic Growth Through Research and Development. So what we have done is we have had three very important sessions that have, that have concluded. And once the, uh, the findings of those are presented to us, we would like the, these three eminent panelists to come in and help us to look at how we could achieve these objectives. Uh, let me, without wasting time, introduce the three panelists I have this evening. First is Vidya Jyoti, Dr. Bandula Vijay. Dr. Vijay is an expert, in, you know, is an expert in innovative cardiovascular and is an American inventor, businessman, and a diplomat. He is the honorary professor in clinical medicine at the KDU and an ambassador for science and technology and innovation to Sri Lanka. He is currently the president of Leo Med LLC, a medical device company. Dr. Vijay was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the President of Sri Lanka in 2016, Vidya Jyoti Award in 2017, and other, and other Derana, Sri Lanka Global Invent of the Year in 2018. The second panelist we have is Dr. Hans Vijay Surya. He's currently the Chief Executive Officer, Telecommunication Business, and Group Executive Vice President of Axiata. Asia's second largest telecommunication group. He was the group chief executive officer of Dialogue Jaxiata PLC in Sri Lanka up to 2016. Dr. Vijay Surya is the immediate past chair of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, and he has served on the founding board of directors of ICTA and Slintech. He is also the past chair of RC Clark Institute for Modern Technologies. In 2008, Dr. Vijay Surya was named the Sri Lankan of the Year by Sri Lanka's premier business journal, LMD. And in 2016, he was honored by the global mobile industry body, the GSM Association, as its first recipient of the outstanding contribution to the Asian. Uh, apologies, I believe we have a small technical issue. Um, till I, I believe Professor Malik is back. I will hand. Yeah. Uh, Mohotla was the managing director and partner at Boston Consulting Group with experience in Indo Pacific, the EU, and the US. Prior to that, Mr. Mohotla worked with Unilever Sri Lanka and at Millennium IT. Right. Now, without with that, with the three eminent speakers helping us, or panelists helping us. Before we start, I will invite Dr. Venra Villegidara to present the findings very briefly of the three sessions that we have completed so that it, we get a chance to lead into the discussion after that. So, Dr. Venra Dr. Villegidara is a senior lecturer attached to the Faculty of Business at the University of Morocco. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, well, we had three very interesting uh, discussions from uh, today from two o'clock onwards. Uh, the first discussion was focusing on agriculture, food processing and manufacturing. Um, over there, we looked at basically the transformation which is needed in the agriculture sector, uh, particularly given that Sri Lanka is an agricultural country traditionally, how agriculture has declined over time. Um, and the number of people employed as well, the contribution to GDP has declined over time was discussed. Uh, how we can change this in term and improve our position in terms of the sustainable development goals, particularly goal two as well as goal nine, how we can go towards that, move towards that was discussed at length. Uh, furthermore, the importance of technology transfer was discussed 
particularly in the area of uh, agriculture, food processing and manufacturing. Uh, an example was given in the area of food processing in the uh, example of uh, walls, ice streams, etc. cetera. Um, furthermore, product and process improvements uh, were discussed at length, particularly uh, the areas that were discussed include waste management, as well as uh, a number of other ideas such as uh, bioenergy um, and things like that, which came out of the conversations that we had. Overall, there was a lot of focus on multidisciplinary research which is needed uh, in these areas uh, to actually uh, inform policy making uh, to ensure that the agriculture sector will be a productive uh, and a thriving one in the future. Uh, and that was mainly discussed over there. And in fact, um, it was also stated that uh, the importance of linking agriculture with manufacturing in terms of research um, and uh, how uh, both of them should go together and research should happen in that sense as well. And a new initiative called uh, Farmer was uh, proposed by one of the panelists over there. Secondly, energy infrastructure and uh, in energy infrastructure, cities and transportation was the uh, title of the second uh, panel discussion. Uh, over there, the idea of sustainability was discussed at length, uh, particularly the, the overall broad view of sustainable cities when it comes to uh, our sustainable development agenda in 2030 UN agenda, et cetera, uh, were focused on over there. Um, uh, however, the idea that I think we got out of it mainly was that uh, research in silos um, happen a lot in, in terms of uh, academic research in some cases, and, and it is more important to do research in, a, uh, in terms of uh, sustainable development, linking all these different areas. Um, uh, so that was discussed at length by the panel over there. Uh, another focus on the uh, discussion was this uh, renewable energy uh, agenda of the government, which is to achieve a 70% renewable energy uh, of the overall um, capacity uh, by uh, 2050. So, so the, uh, there was a lot of discussion surrounding that, the possibilities of that, the advantages of that, the disadvantages of that, etc., cetera, uh, were discussed. However, the requirement in terms of environmental uh, requirements and the climate change issues were discussed over there as well. Uh, furthermore, the construction in, uh, the sector uh, was represented and the construction sector, the panelists representing the construct construction sector uh, in, uh, mentioned that there's a dire need for research in the area uh, to improve uh, certain aspects such as cost escalations and things like that uh, to give you a little bit of idea. And furthermore, the dissemination of research in an understandable manner to the industry and the society by academics uh, were focused on uh, as well. Then thirdly, uh, we had a, a very insightful discussion on the digital economy and R&D. Over there, a number of uh, different ideas were focused on, uh, particularly this idea of a digital good and a digital service were discussed and explained uh, quite well. Furthermore, um, the growth of the digital economy, um, uh, we, we discussed how we are at a turning point in this exponential growth um, and uh, due to new concepts such as quantum computing, neuroformic computing, as well as uh, artificial intelligence, uh, these sectors will grow further in the future and how Sri Lanka should adopt some of these things and how we can survive in, in, in the digital economy were discussed um, at length over there as well. Furthermore, the importance of this for the SME sector, the small, medium and enterprise enterprises sector were discussed um, and, um, and it was discussed that in fact, these firms can actually adopt quite well, even, they're small, even though they're small, sometimes even better than the bigger firms. Uh, furthermore, education, uh, how education should evolve in the digital era was discussed and the awareness of digital skills were emphasized by a number of the panelists uh, over there as well. Um, a lot of discussion happened uh, of how the industry has to link with academia in order to um, improve and solve uh, certain problems that the industry has 
and how the government has to play a role in their policy making in bringing these two uh, uh, sectors together also were discussed, I guess, in all three panel discussions. Uh, basically, that is the basic idea uh, in a nutshell, uh, Professor. I hand it over to you. Thank you, Anura. Um, now let's start. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have, we'll, I'll give five minutes each to the three panelists to say a few initial remarks, after which I will go into some questions that will help us to try and bring the whole thing together. Can I start with, uh, with the Ayurveda, Dr. Mandula Vijay, uh, to give his initial remarks. Of course, he's a, such a versatile person that even though I'm asking him to look at agriculture, food process and manufacturing, I'm sure he, he is capable of helping us there. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Malik. Uh, thank you for having me for this uh, forum. Uh, last uh, so many years, I have been quite involved in the area of science and technology, how to develop uh, science and technology in Sri Lanka. So what I learned over these years is, uh, and also based on my experience in the United States is, uh, and I believe in, in multiple speeches I have given in Sri Lanka, and I have said this many, 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 many times, is uh, I am now aware of the situation the country is today because of the pandemic, but also the country was in in the last 15, 20 years, uh, irrespective of the pandemic, uh, is that, uh, are we doing the right thing? So my advice uh, is something like, uh, there's, there's a lot to be learned from the United States. I don't mean everything, we don't do everything right. There are a lot of things we do not do right, of course, but there are a lot of things we do right here in the United States. So in that sense, what you all know that the way we live today from the way we were children so many 30, 40, 50 years ago is that life has changed mainly because of the things that happen in the United States and particularly in three or four states in California, in uh, upstate in uh, Boston area and here in Texas. Uh, so that what was done here changed the way we live. In fact, the way you and I are talking is something that originated here. And you can think of just about anything in the life that has changed in, 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 in medicine, in communications, in everything, it happened here. And earlier, uh, some uh, one of the speakers said something that you do in the garage, and that is totally true. It, everything starts in a garage in the United States. So I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from that. So what my advice is, is we should focus, and, and I know this, this is kind of out of line in normal thinking, is to focus to develop disruptive technologies, not just to be a country that serves uh, like uh, job centers and you know number crunching or doing software programming, uh, instead of doing that, but just to do de de develop disruptive technologies. And can it be done? Yes, it can be done because Sri Lankans who live in the United States are in positions doing the very same thing. So I know it can be done. Now, what I'm saying is applicable not only for uh, agriculture and, and food technology, but for everything. It's because unless we do disruptive technologies, it is very hard for us to sell our labor time to be competitive in the world. We are, our labor is very expensive. Uh, as uh, I know for sure, because I'm working with some people in Pakistan and in China uh, and uh, some people, people in Ukraine and Sri Lanka labor is the most expensive of all these things, countries. So with this expensive labor, we have to develop and sell expensive products, not just uh, where you, you can charge on, on, on labor, labor rates. The, like uh, garments and things like that. I'm not saying it should not be done, but I think we should focus and uh, try to start uh, on new disruptive technologies, technologies that has not been done anywhere in the world. That means you have to come up with a new thing that is, doesn't exist in the world. So that should be the focus. So there are certain things that we need in order to achieve and not to come to that, uh, that platform. First thing I, am, I, I would recommend is collaboration. One of the things that I, uh, I see 
quite lacking in the country is collaboration. You know, we engineers do not talk with the doctors. Doctors are not talking with us. We are not talking with the farmers. We are not in the in in the farms talking in the people in agriculture. We are not working with the social science people. So we we have to get into a situation where we are talking to each other. People of different disciplines are talking to each other. So that that I think is one of the biggest issue that we need to address being able to collaborate. And I know as my position as the ambassador for science and technology, I have visited Sri Lanka and I see there is very little or no collaboration between even the universities. So there was a time that uh, the time of Dengu when I brought a delegation from the United States, I found there was not enough collaboration even among universities. I think the universities should uh, focus on serving the needs of the country. So what is the country needs? And there has to be a connection made between what the country needs and what the universities can provide. Uh, and in doing so, one of the most important words that I, I want to discuss today is the word what. What is it that we have to do today that will make a change in our country? This word what is very important because in the world, there are the why, the what, and how people. So the why people were the great scientists in the past. They were curious, they developed, they found the answers for why. Why does this thing happen? Such as Newton figured out when the apple fell, why did it fall? And how are the how people are the people who, they we do everything, the engineers, the doctors, the lawyers, we know how to do something. But the people who change the way we live today are the people who realize what to do. Look at simple things like Amazon. You know, you know, you know about Amazon. What to do? He figured out what is it that he has to do to build a global company. Figure out Facebook. It's people figure out what is it that they have to do to change the way we live. So it is the focusing on what is it that we have to do today to, 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 to bring the country forward. And we can stand out as a leader in technology, like Israel, like South Korea, like even Taiwan. We can be, I mean, I mentioned these countries because these are small countries. We can be a leader if we focus on what is it that we had to do and hit a home run, or in, if you talk in cricket, hit a sixer, so that we become a country that is known for developing technology. If you meet, Somebody in the elevator in the United States, people think this IT. Now, this just a few days ago, a 37-year-old Indian IIT graduate became the CEO of Twitter. Now, what is it that we have to do to acquire and come to that level? When I am in an elevator, somebody will look at me and say, oh, you're from Sri Lanka, and you guys develop this. So this is what we, are, we need to get at. And that comes from these various things about education, collaboration, and figuring out, out what is it that we have to do. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Doctor. Let me now turn to Dr. Hans Vijayasuriya uh, for his thoughts, focusing a little bit on the digital economy that was discussed. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Malink. Good evening uh, to everyone, uh, honor and privilege. Uh, to be on this panel amongst uh, such a eminent uh, set of colleagues. Uh, I'll try to uh, share some thoughts on the uh, perspective of a digital economy with the focus on R&D and the role of R&D uh, within this very expansive topic. I think there are many, many definitions of digital economy in itself. <coughs> but just to put some shape, I. I scribbled down and thought I had. And that is that broadly, there are two perspectives of the digital economy in the context of what we're talking about today. One is economy in the digital age. And this would relate to the role of R&D, role of innovation in the economy in a digital age. And when we talk of economy in a digital age, we are talking about surviving, winning, uh, we are talking about competitive advantage versus competing nations. 
and how R&D can be deployed to survive and or win as an economy in the digital age. So that is one angle or uh, viewpoint, view angle on the digital economy. The second view angle is R&D to support or accelerate the digitalization of the economy. Now these two are very closely linked, but not necessarily the same. So let me uh, just uh, move on with the first of these, which is the fundamentals of an economy and the role of R&D in the digital age. And I, I think this is very relevant to Sri Lanka because as an emerging uh, nation uh, in economic terms, uh, called an emerging market, uh, we and a developing country, then the runway we have is very short in terms of adjusting our economy for survival or victory within the, the context and frame of the digital age. The <coughs> dominant term, the dominant um, driver here is speed. We call it exponential times. Uh, there are various uh, terminology that's used for the speed of change today and the speed of innovation in the world around. And therefore the runway we have is also very tight to adjust our economic fundamentals to be able to compete in this, in this new world. So some of the sub dimensions of this uh, related to competitive advantage would be obviously the, the search for innovation capital because innovation capital would flow in the direction of those nations who can, as uh, Dr. Vijay very correctly put it, who have a brand and who have established credentials and credibility on the, on the landscape of innovation. And this can be built up through the digital quotient in exports, when I talk of exports very broadly, digital quotient in globally, uh, used products and services from the country. Uh, the uh, focus also on digital and ICT products, which uh, are increasingly dominant in a digital age in terms of consumption. And I think importantly, the concept of traceability, uh, especially in a collaborative world, uh, whether it's in manufacturing or in services or in innovation itself, in the construction of IP of global products. Uh, traceability becomes uh, very important. And last but not least, where this all sums up is that I think we should be ambitious enough to position innovation itself as a destination for foreign investment. And of course, domestic investment as well. But when we talk of FDI, why not think of attracting FDI into R&D, into the R&D facility? And for this, I think universities as well as uh, uh, corporate innovation needs to be restructured somewhat into, into commercialized structures, which with sufficiently narrow as well as specialized focus, which can attract global capital uh, into the country. Now, these are realities in the digital economy globally. And if you are to survive, if you are to win, then we have to play and have, a, have Sri Lanka also as an innovation destination where people put money into labs in Sri Lanka, for example. And for that, the structure of how R&D is placed, how it is funded, uh, the returns for those who invest has to be thought through. And I think the universities are in pole position to uh, restructure and uh, have a fairly granular and uh, commercialized and you know, suitable, suitable corporate structure to enable this inward uh, investment. Here I have a thought that it's actually uh, to uh, Dr. Vijay's uh, uh, description of the USA environment as well. I think I always think of the USA as being so rich in capital for failure because it's because there's an abundance of capital to fund failure that the successes have also been possible. It's an inverse way of thinking about it. 
But if if capital didn't go into the many, many failed startups, the many, many failed experiments, then we would also not have the success. So I think this is something where if we open our investment funnel to the global capital market, uh, whether it's uh, private capital or uh, innovation, I think the resource base for sufficient amount of experimentation, failure, and therefore the birth of uh, unicorns or uh, globally competitive uh, tech companies and tech innovations uh, will be a possibility. Um, I'll move to the second uh, one, which was second dimension to the perspective, which was R&D to support digitization of the economy. I think this is more straightforward. This is one where obviously we have to recognize that the emerging technologies are centered on IR 4.0. And these technologies offer a lot of potential for the digitalization of multiple industry verticals, agriculture, health, tourism, um, e-government, uh, e-societies, uh, collaboration, et cetera. And uh, this is where I think the universities can reposition again on a vertical, industry vertical orientation uh, because money and investment from the corporate sector will be segmented by focused interest areas, focused specialization. Uh, corporates will be less and less attuned to putting money into broad topics because everyone is in a crunch and everyone is in a race. Uh, so they would look to uh, universities solving, I wouldn't call it top down, but I would say outside in uh, research problems, uh, outside in uh, R&D challenges, and clearly focused on problem and solution. Uh, not uh, solutions looking for problems, but clearly uh, uh, solutions which are uh, aimed at specific problems. And so being specific, Specialized as opposed to generalized, I think, would help the university system and the R&D uh, ecosystem in the country overall to support the digitalization of industry verticals, service verticals within the economy. Now, if you can do both these things, prepare our economy to compete in a digital world, and at the same time, digitize our economy, I think R&D plays a very uh, uh, significant role in the, both these dimensions. I'll very quickly, uh, before I close uh, here, uh, also uh, talk a little bit about the IR4 context, because I think in this digital era, there are uh, three or four, what I would call mega trends. And uh, IR4 itself, the technologies within IR4 being one of them. And um, the second is data within, of course, you can, think about it within the overall context of IR4. But data in particular uh, is very important to think about because when we look at the global tech investments uh, going forward, the projection is that a majority of global tech investments, or, sorry, the majority of the growth in global tech investment, meaning the incremental piece, let's assume that Sri Lanka will find it difficult to fight for the incumbent piece the global market shares in tech investment. But the incremental piece is majority focused or going to be majority focused on technologies which are centered on data. Uh, data, therefore AI, therefore uh, computing, et cetera, which I think uh, we just mentioned, uh, quantum computing, et cetera. So it's something to think about and whether there's an opportunity to leapfrog our competitive position, uh, focusing on these areas around, very broadly speaking, uh, data. The other mega trend uh, which plays in our favor is the dominance of or the increasing importance of ecosystems and globalization. Uh, in tomorrow's world, size is not necessarily a handicap. Now we have as Sri Lankans uh, and technologists in Sri Lanka uh, taken a beating in the past uh, because of the small market size of Sri Lanka. Uh, and the smaller ecosystems. But in the digital era, uh, the scale of the web or web scale as we call it, enables the smallest of uh, 
innovative uh, innovative ideas or the smallest of innovation centers to attach in the form of a jewel in a much larger crown uh, globally uh, in order to play a role in global innovation. And the question is, how do we prepare for that? Are our policies ready uh, in terms of uh, IP, uh, in terms of uh, export policies, in terms of uh, intergovernmental or in, even intercorporate agreements, et cetera, globally? Uh, how, how these new structures around uh, intricate ecosystems could uh, be uh, brought to bear and increase the uh, competitive advantage uh, to Sri Lanka. So with technologies like blockchain, uh, for example, uh, these are very durable structures from a business point of view and a legal point of view, I believe. Uh, so I'll stop there. Uh, I think uh, I Thank you, Dr. Dr. Hans. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll invite Sanjay to, Mr. Sanjay Mahota to give a few thoughts on, on the third team. Uh, thanks, Professor Malik, and uh, thanks again for inviting me to be part of this uh, prominent panel. And I think what a pertinent topic that we're discussing uh, today. And on the three areas that uh, which was highlighted for me, which was energy, um, the infrastructure, um, and also cities and transportation. Uh, we, we as a country is at a very, um, how do I say, interesting inflection point, right? As an economy, we are around $4,000 per capita GDP. Uh, typical, the next big milestone is around uh, doubling of that GDP, about $8,000. So around $4,000 is where the high, well, the, 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 a lot of the economic activity takes place, where the economies and the cities get redefined uh, in, as, as they go through that um, growth cycle, where a lot of urbanization comes along, uh, the new technologies uh, comes in, uh, planned and unplanned city growth comes in, transportation, mobility becomes important thing. There's going to have much more excess cash uh, within people's pockets, so that drives uh, energy consumption and all that. So there's a lot of those trends that the country like Sri Lanka would see in the next five to ten years. And I think more importantly, these these are we call the mega trends are exaggerated by the digital trends, I would say. Right, so I think Hans very articulately talked about uh, the digital economy, the impact of digitization, and all the benefits that uh, are brought through by digitization. But also, if you look at the energy uh, sphere, the technologies are changing, right? So if you look at the solar panels, what the cost was five years or 10 years ago, now it has become so cheap um, in places like Dubai and uh, in uh, UAE, it has come down to maybe 1.2 cents per watt. Now, further, further little down on that, because at the end of the day, um, solar panels are on, on a, on a Maslow's, uh, sorry, not Maslow's, uh, on a uh, digital silica kind of a growth thing, so which, which gets efficiency as it grows, and with uh, perovskite cells and all that coming in moment it comes around 0.7 cents or 0.6 cents, but what the number was, the hydrogen economy becomes viable, right? So that becomes a whole game changer in the economy, the landscape and the energy landscape. So there's a whole new, new, new era, new development of hydrogen-based vehicles, hydrogen storage, um, hydrogen being used as an energy source at homes. All these will happen in the next period of five years. So it's, if you look at uh, the cost of uh, solar panels, it just has to double in efficiency once or twice. And then you have a complete transformative energy landscape. So for a country like us, the R&D on both sides, both on the applied R&D as well as pure R&D is critical to make sure that these technologies and these uh, changes uh, in the landscape can be amalgamated or brought in uh, to the, the ecosystem. So that's just a little bit about the energy part of it. On the infra, it's still, it's the same, right? Uh, the new building technologies that's coming in, right? Everyone looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon neutral cement, you know, uh, for example, if you look at the COP26, uh, Bill Gates was talking about how to reduce emissions from cement manufacturing and new, new uh, avenues of reducing uh, carbon footprint and bringing in technology, bringing in new R&D to think about uh, how do you uh, introduce new building materials 
building material recycling and so and so forth. And then the last part of it is, is the cities, right? The cities development is critical for us. And I think one of the things that we really need to get right, and where there are a lot of uh, R&D, and I'm sure in the monitor also, there's a lot of the city planners I've got involved, is planning a, we call it a livable city um, as we go on, right? So if you look at countries like Singapore has gone to more in, in terms of greener cities while there's higher densities, and in Sri Lanka is becoming, uh, if you say Colombo is becoming a very high density uh, city. If you look at 10 years ago, the amount of high rises versus now and what's what's into. So in terms of how you're bringing the technology, right? So, and and uh, uh, Professor Bandula would know that there's a lot of these research being done in terms of having transparent panels to uh, produce solar, having double glazed glasses. These are smaller things to start with, but then all think about like, how do you have easily commutable, uh, where time is not wasted, uh, bringing in mass rapid transit systems. So those are very important for a country like us. You can look at like countries like Bolivia and say like, okay, maybe the bus network is the right thing, or the light rails or monorails, which of it is, we need to bring that uh, part of the technology uh, uh, into the planning cycle. So for, for these three topics, I think where the biggest challenge we have is the long lead time on the planning and the faster changing the technologies. So we need to match these two very carefully. And, and I think we need to have the North Star very well defined, but be very agile in terms of really looking at uh, which technologies to take on at what point. And how does that adoption happen uh, in the Sri Lankan context? Um, and the, the most importantly, given the, uh, the polyproficial technology and being able to access knowledge from anywhere, some of the PO research always used to follow, follow big clusters in the past. UCLA used to get a billion dollars of uh, research funding. So there are a lot of PO researchers happened to have, used to happen there. Right? So was Stanford, so was MIT and so on and so forth. But now, because of the global collaboration, like if you see like Morotua, we can actually do quite a bit of research. Now, good example is like uh, some of the graphene patterns that was done in Slintec. But just like what uh, Professor Bandula talked about, even in these areas, most of the universities do their research very in isolated way, even in Sri Lanka. And there's a quite a bit of repetition we see. So the, the important thing is on the PO research, we have to have a coordinated themes, right? Because if you look at energy, city planning or infra, that also translates into the technology because uh, all that has to be built in. And then secondly, we need to think about what is the PO research we are doing versus what is applied research we're doing in terms of uh, getting that into the, into the ecosystem, getting that implemented and, and certain things that we can fast track. Now, for example, one of our alumni, um, uh, Harshad Kojen, we're trying to build these three wheelers for uh, electric purposes, right? So that actually gets two benefits. One is the cost of the product goes down. Uh, the person who uses it get benefits uh, on a pure R&D point of view. And also it gives the energy independence. So there's many aspects that these R&D can actually uh, end up uh, you know, addressing. So in, in a short, all of these key trends uh, around urbanization, we just don't have to do everything here. We just need to look at what, what's working in the other countries and try to adapt this fast because fast adoption or fast follower is also a technology technique that we need to follow because we may not have the, the full-fledged capabilities of doing pure research like what the other countries are doing. That's okay, but we can reinvent a, a different way what we, somebody has done. So that's something that we need to do quickly. Secondly, I think the part of it is that the private sector also has to be a uh, equitable part of this journey. And I think Slintech was uh, set up with that uh, objective, but we need to make sure that a central uh, mechanism where public-private partnership comes together into doing, uh, driving this research is paramount, right? For example, if you're doing infrastructure, um, say we have a big waste problem uh, around plastics, right? So how do we get that built into uh, putting uh, good asphalts on the, on the roads or different type of ma maintenance, right? Those, those are kind of the, the private sector driven the university supported uh, uh, R&D or the developments that needs to come in. And I think that is something that has to be strengthened um, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I, I would say that partnership, if I look at certain countries, like even our neighbors like India, uh, we are a little weaker, but I think we could do much, much more. Uh, in certain countries, there is a certain percentage you have to uh, allocate for R&D and you get tax reductions and all that. And I think that's one of the things that we also need to think about 
because if you want to drive innovation, if you want to drive uh, uh, the the the, the R and D capabilities, that's something that we really need to do. But I guess on the other side, um, there are many of our uh, bright sparks who are doing cutting edge R and D uh, in many places, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, all, all uh, even. But some of them getting back, and I think uh, giving the impetus or giving the the nuclei to start that kind of R and D efforts here is also needed that sort of a collaboration is also needed. So in, in short, uh, this is an area which is evolving very fast because and the mega trends are with us because of the economic growth trajectory. The digital uh, uh, disruptions are coming in, new technologies coming in in the innovation. So it's actually a hotbed of, uh, uh, not, I would say non-linear innovation in a way. So that's something uh, that uh, our students were listening in uh, hopefully can take advantage uh, as they think of and building uh, on the R&D opportunities. Thank you, Sanjay. Right. I mean, there are lots of, it, the three discussions have been fantastic. That's why I didn't want to disrupt, uh, disrupt and stop you and, and giving you time, time. Now, three keywords I heard. One was disruptive tele, uh, technologies and uh, collaborations from uh, Dr. Bandula Vijay the problem to solution research from Dr. Hans and the fast follow from Sanjay Mortal. Now, university's research is, is, is at, a, at, at a crossroad. We need to be, but, but, but the whole purpose of this uh, uh, seminar, I believe, is to find out how exactly to go about it. We have had the typical university model where the researcher does a problem, he publishes a paper, maybe some gets picked up, majority doesn't. Now, on the other hand, we would really like to look at where the university can drive research, give a topic or give an area, economic centric, uh, and then how could we actually do it? So the, I, I really would appreciate your thoughts because even though it's, it sounds ideal, two, two questions come up to me as, as a, both as a researcher and administrator. Where would you find funds for it if the state is not really pushing those? Or how could we convince the state to, to uh, to come into it, also be able to fund it. Because as, as it was mentioned by Sanjay, most of the corporates in Sri Lanka tend to be fast followers. If they need something, they would much rather get it from somewhere else than really come to our universities and, and spend, keep time or, or, waste, or spend time on it. So with those few words, my question is, should the university focus a lot more on multidisciplinary top-down research or focus more on problem to solution type that Dr. Hans proposed, which, uh, which again needs a lot of collaboration. Can I start with Dr. Bandulu Vijay, since you have? Professor Malik, you made a very, very uh, strong point there. Uh, when Sri Lanka needs some technology, unfortunately, uh, the tendency is to look outside, uh, look in the West or look into China. But uh, the tendency should be that you, you develop a culture of developing it yourself. This is very important. And that really starts from the formative uh, ages, like uh, maybe even before the university time, like in high school or before high school and during university time. So uh, the other point you asked about was uh, about the funding. Now it is true that for R&D and come up with new ideas, develop new products, you, you need funding. But if you look at the history that happened in the United States, most of these, uh, these uh, things that change how we live uh, started in garage with basically what we call bootstrapping. So if you, if you, if you there's a movie I think about uh, the Apple uh, founder. Uh, uh, and uh, so likewise, most of the things, even in my own case, Everything started in the garage with basically uh, very basic next to nothing funding. Although in order to take it from that point of innovation to the next level of commercialization, you need money. So one of the things that I, I have suggested in the past and continue to do so is that if the, if the country can develop a, a fund or some sort of a mutual fund that is subscribed by people, not necessarily big corporations who will put millions of rupees, dollars to into it, but subscribed by people who would invest uh, 100 rupees, 1,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees into a fund 
that is managed by a fund manager. So you will have uh, several millions of uh, dollars equivalent in rupees. And then uh, people will submit their uh, proposals to this fund and say, I have this idea. I want to develop this is a cutting edge idea. And then a, a panel can look into it, which happens all the time here in the United States. And then uh, say, OK, here's, here's the investment that you need in order for you to uh, carry to the next stage. So this developing a fund, uh, sort of a mutual public fund, OK, managed by a professional money manager, not by the government, managed by a professional money manager. Uh, if you can establish that, and few universities can get together, uh, Maratu Aruna, Peradeni, and others can get together and kind of be the leader to establish this fund. Uh, uh, that way, uh, uh, the, uh, the development. The most important message that I have to give you is you have to be self-reliant, self-dependent. You have to think that, yes, we can do it here in Sri Lanka. We can serve us, the people in Sri Lanka, plus we can serve people of the world. That has to happen in the, you know, through the university system. Just last week, and I sent a copy of this to Professor Ajit, uh, I looked at the uh, uh, engineering university world ranking. 10, 15 years ago, we thought, okay, MIT, Stanford, right? No longer. The top, university, top engineering universities in the world are in China. Now think about it, how in 10 to 15 years, how did they get that? They got that by imitating what we did in the United States and being depending on themselves. They develop this technology, the skill set, the power by themselves. If you look at this uh, uh, listing, uh, you will be surprised. The top 100 universities, majority of them are in China. Of course, we are there too, MIT, Texas, uh, Caltech and everybody's there, but you know, they, they are taking over and you had to, we had to figure it out. How did they do that? And that's uh, that a lot of self-reliance. I mean, this is the strongest message I can give you is self-reliance. Make education applications oriented so that I would suggest all the university professors to stop teaching. The day you stop teaching is the day the country can go forward. We do not want to get in front of a classroom and teach. I, I, I started teaching after I retired, okay? So in the beginning, I prepared my, my coursework and I started teaching the traditional way, but I switched in less than one semester, I switched to stop teaching, but in order to make them learn. That is another important, because if you can learn to learn, then you can learn to develop new things. New, new ideas, new disruptive methods. So that's the message that I can give. I hope uh, I can, uh, my, that's my contribution. Um, Dr. Hans, uh, along with that, I also would like to look at you to look at, to address the issue about university industry relationships and partnerships. It's very important for R&D, but um, it is also very frustrating sometimes for the universities to build that relationship. Um, I, I know you're an exception, you and, you and Dialogue has been always ready open for it, but how do we go about convincing? Uh, one thing is why being the problem, looking at the problem and solution, but also otherwise, how do we really approach and convince industries that it is worthwhile spending time and money on the university research? I think that's a uh, <coughs> question, uh, Professor and I, uh, just to go back to that dialogue example, way back in 2003, I think it was one of the early uh, uh, industry, industry uh, university collaboration uh, in the field of, I think small R, big D. Uh, and uh, I think the results to the company as well as uh, to the industry as a whole have been very uh, positive. The, I think the parallel industry also had a similar collaboration uh, with more to university. Uh, so I, I think learning from uh, those two, I'm not sure the genesis of the apparel, uh, but um, I think the university does need to project that commercial front in some way. 
uh, to convince corporates that um, the university approach to R&D is very problem solution oriented, that uh, it obviously has the skills, but can the skills be codified in a way which business understands those skills? And the performance and outcome management systems um, of, the, uh, of this entity, which the university co-creates, would be aligned to uh, the corporate sector or, or the business sector. And I, I don't, I wouldn't say private sector, but I think it should apply equally even to an university state enterprise collaboration. Because unless there are uh, clear performance management processes or outcome management processes, and not to say that it should be simply outcome driven alone, the process is also important, but the uh, formulation of those guidelines will, I think, convince the partners to uh, collaborate. Uh, but the other side of the coin is that I think industry also needs to uh, uh, value the importance uh, and value research and development and innovation. I think uh, the, the industry talks about innovation. There's a lot of rhetoric around innovation uh, and they call them, you know, industries and players within various industries call themselves innovative. Uh, and they buy into that concept, but will they put capital behind that concept? And will they also collaborate in order to accelerate the achievement of that concept? Uh, collaboration will accelerate. Uh, doing it on your own will you know, be that much slower. So these are concepts I think that we need to learn in the private sector, in the industry sector, that um, A, we need to put money where our mouth is when we talk about innovation, we have to fund innovation. And in funding innovation, we need to recognize that we can't do it alone and we need partners. And then we get down to the point that among the available partners uh, in Sri Lanka, clearly the university system, which is focused on, on R&D is a, a partner of choice. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hans. But I just mentioned that the experiment we did with the dialogue uh, research lab has caught on NIT. We have a few more, quite a few more now running at Monotour. Thank you for that support you gave us at that time. Let, that's that's since great. Running, since we are just running out of time, let me ask the final question from uh, Mr. Uh, Mohtala. Um, the, the research part, how can we develop this? you know, city industry relationships and the research that comes out more into the policy sector. That seems to be another of those issues that we have. We do it, we come and then we suddenly hit a bottleneck, not being able to push beyond. And that, that to a large extent, I think depends a lot on the, on the policy makers and the, the key players like yourself. With your experience, how would you see us trying to break into that or break that barrier down? I know it's well, a difficult one. <laughs> uh, I think, Professor Malik, I think if you have got this right, I think we, as a country, would have been probably in a better position. I, than many other things, right? I think the, I think I would break it down in a couple of ways. One is that the, if you look at the collaboration that Dr. Hans, uh, the dialogue at that time, 2003, and had, and he was talking about how uh, a fruitful partnership it is. Now we could do that in 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 uh, much more force, right? I'm sure in the building sector, there is a lot of R&D that's going on. I know for that uh, with the uh, uh, our civil, civil department, right? So uh, metallurgy, similar things, there's, there's a lot of things going on. So I think what we need to make sure is it's, it's a two-way street, right? Uh, and I sometimes we wait till the research projects comes in. We, and I think the other one is like, anyone who, who's involved in these kind of commercial um, research opportunities, you can look at the rest of the world and go back to a company and say like, hey, this is, this is a, a convergence of technologies that we can think of where we could get this kind of advantage. How do you want to engage, right? So I think that, that ought to happen. So then uh, if that happens, I think that will be much better because I think Slintech is trying to do that, but doesn't have the necessarily the, the, the main policy thrust, but it takes in key ideas and try to incubate something new. On the policy point of view, and I think the one of the biggest uh, issues this country has been plagued, and be very honest, with, is the policy consistency. 
um, it is uh, it is the thematic policy consistency is more important when it comes to research versus uh, some things that changes very rapidly around taxes and all that. But at least if we as a country say like, okay, R and D is something important, right? Uh, or social well-being is something important. We urge all the companies to allocate, right, just like what you do on the social re responsibility reporting, a certain percentage onto R and D, a certain percentage onto um, social well-being and things like that. So that way, and then what we need to do is we need to get a couple of things and say, what are mega trends that hit us? And, and the university system comes together and say, what are the policy, uh, what are the kind of the, the thrust verticals or thrust sectors, key questions we're trying to answer, right? And then we do the research around that because we always look at and say policies, what the government set down, no. Because being green is also uh, like, or being environmentally uh, conscious is also a profitable thing. If you look at like, I'm taking an example of uh, how we, most of the companies have got together to clean the, the rivers, right? Where they put strainers and how much plastic they collect and all that. So we can say like, okay, it's about packaging is a thematic thing that we need to address because as we become richer, we are going to have much more, um, you know, uh, easy to consume things coming in. What are the technologies that I need to bring in and how do I make it adaptable for Sri Lanka so that I can actually get a cost advantage or something like that just to produce it in Sri Lanka. Now that is kind of a, like a localization of a technology. Now that theme or that policy or that social responsibility, it's a public private partnership decision that they're going to take it. It doesn't have to come from a policy from a government to do it. Now it could be a self-regulator. So I think there are areas that we can do. Energy is such, right? Grid independence, <laughs> right? Smarter, smarter, smarter uh, technologies for house construction and all of those kind of things. Stuff. These are such. But the, sometimes once you get into that frame, the policy can support to get it accelerated. But if you wait for someone to concede the policy, yeah. uh, to say what needs to get done, and by the time the policy is done about three years at the government change or whatever will happen, then we miss the bus. I think the key important thing is Again, look at the spectrum of R&D and I look at it and say like, what can be implemented and where we can accrue benefits, you do that. Where it matters in terms of uh, the, the, the next five, 10 years, we want, if we can play in a place, we play that. For example, right, we have excellent eye weather. Just take an example. How much of R&D have you really done into really understand that and say like, okay, what are the active ingredients? Because in Western medicine, you take a pill, paracetamol, it's, it's one molecule, right? In, in, in our Ayurveda, it's always a concoction because if you take paracetamol or, or a lot more, you'll get the liver damage. Right? So you have a concoction because it negates out a lot of the goods and the bads. So what can we do? Now that is a, it doesn't have to be a policy because it can be a policy which drives uh, economic liberation for the poor who can grow this. It can drive our tourism sector. It can drive our well-being and being having a healthy, um, uh, you know, longer living uh, individuals in the country. It will have economic benefit of uh, right for exports and all that, and 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 we can be what TCM has to be to has or traditional Chinese medicine has been to China. But we don't have to wait for policy to do that. But what we need is that thrust to be aligned, and we say, okay, this is how it is. Here's how the public sector comes in. Here's the private sector comes in. Here's the R and D part comes in. This is the policy part that needs to come in. All right, let's move. We may not have every piece in the jigsaw puzzle, but I think we need to get started moment we have enough uh, pieces to get that corner that's how i would look at it in a practical point of view uh, professor malik otherwise we probably will have the same conversation five years down the line i would say no. <laughs> right with that with that thought i will say thank you to the panel and and close this session because we have just passed the time we were supposed to six, finish at six o'clock but then we started it late thank you very much it has been a great uh, session and we have, we have learned a lot out of this discussion and I'm sure all the all the viewers who are participating in this webinar would benefit immensely from the three of you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And on behalf of the University of Moritua, let me thank you once again. And let me hand it over to Vendura for the final word. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, it was indeed a very engaging uh, discussion. And I personally learned a lot uh, today as well. Uh, so we always wonder uh, how and when our country will change from developing to developed. So I guess uh, uh, if you listen to today's conversations, uh, many of the answers are out there. Uh, 
Uh, so um, it, it, it were, they were all very interesting conversations indeed. And uh, the, in the final discussion, we had a synoptic session of all coming together and uh, how we can implement um, or in, uh, make uh, do research that actually informs policy uh, making was the uh, final uh, 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 discussion. And we had uh, uh, very interesting uh, comments and feedback from our panelists over there. So with that, uh, we come to the end of our discussions um, and uh, we would like to conclude the session for today. Uh, let me now take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists for joining us uh, from uh, two o'clock onwards. We had four panels uh, discussions and uh, many eminent uh, panelists joined us and uh, they took time off their busy schedule to join us, which was uh, fantastic. And we had uh, a very enjoyable and uh, uh, very informative uh, set of sessions um, uh, throughout the uh, four discussions. Um, and thank you very much on behalf of the Faculty of Graduate Studies. And of course, uh, the three moderators as well, I thank on behalf of the, uh, the, the uh, Faculty of Graduate Studies as well. And all the uh, attendees who listen to us, hopefully you enjoyed the session as, sessions as well. And uh, you uh, too, I hope, will take away uh, something from our sessions to apply for your own work. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to conclude the ses session with that. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.